Act One of the New York Idea by Langdon Mitchell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrated by Margaret S. Bayat. Philip Fillimore. Read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Grace Fillimore. Read by Diana Moylinger. Mrs. Fillimore. Read by Margaret S. Bayat. Miss Hennage. Read by Rashada. Matthew Fillimore. Read by Roger Moline. William Sudley, read by Ob One Two Three. Vida Fillimore, read by Elizabeth Clett. Sir Wilfred Cates Darby, read by Chris Clark. John Carslake, read by M. B. Mrs. Cynthia Carslake, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Brooks, read by Chris Clark. Tim Fiddler, read by Chris Clark. Nogum by Miles Espyat. Thomas. Read by David Muncaster. Benson. Read by Lucy Perry. Scene. Living room in the house of Philip Fillimore. 5 p.m. of an afternoon of May. The general air and appearance of the room is that of an old-fashioned, decorous, comfortable interior. There are no electric lights and no electric bells. Two bell ropes as in old-fashioned houses. The room is in dark tones inclining to somber and of old-fashioned elegance. Seated in the room are Miss Hennage, Mrs. Fillimore, and Thomas. Miss Hennage is a solidly built, narrow-minded woman in her sixties. She makes no effort to look younger than she is, and is expensively but quietly dressed, with heavy elegance. She commands her household and her family connection and on the strength of a large and steady income, feels that her opinion has its value. Mrs. Fillimore is a semi-professional invalid, refined and unintelligent. Her movements are weak and fatigued. Her voice is habitually plaintive, and she is entirely a lady without a trace of being a woman of fashion. Thomas is an easy-mannered but respectful family servant, un-English both in style and appearance. He has no deportment worthy of being so called, and takes an evident interest in the affairs of the family he serves. Miss Hennage is seated at the tea-table, facing the footlights. Mrs. Fillimore is seated at the table on the right. Thomas stands nearby. Tea-things on table. Decanter of sherry and coaster. Bread and butter on plate. Vase with flowers. Silver match-box. Large old-fashioned tea-urn. Guard for flame. The Evening Post on Tea Table. Miss Hennage and Mrs. Fillimore both have cups of tea. Miss Hennage sits up very straight and pours tea for Grace, who enters from door. She is a pretty and fashionably dressed girl of twenty. She speaks superciliously, coolly, and not too fast. She sits on the sofa gracefully and without lounging. She wears a gown suitable for spring visiting, hat, parasol, and gloves. Grace, as she moves to the sofa. I never in my life walked so far and found so few people at home. Pauses, takes off gloves, somewhat querulously. The fact is, the 19th of May is ridiculously late to be in town. Thomas? Mr. Fillimore, Sherry? Thomas, indicating the particular table. The Sherry, ma'am. Mr. Fillimore's post. Pointing to the evening post on the tea table. The post, ma'am. Miss Hennage indicating cup. Miss Fillimore. Thomas takes cup of tea to Grace. Silence. They all sip tea. Thomas goes back, fills sherry glass, remaining round and about the tea table. They all drink tea during their entire conversation. The Dudleys were at home. They wished to know when my brother Philip was to be married, and where and how. If the Dudleys were persons of breeding... They had not intrude their curiosity upon you. I like Lena Dudley. Mrs. Fillimore, speaking slowly and gently. Do I know Miss Dudley? She knows Philip. She expects an announcement of the wedding. I trust you told her that my son, my sister, and myself are all of the opinion that those who have been divorced should remarry with modesty and without parade. I told the Dudleys Philip's wedding was here tomorrow. Miss Hennage to Mrs. Fillimore, picking up a sheet of paper from the table. I have spent the afternoon, Mary, in arranging and listing the wedding gifts, and in writing out the announcements of the wedding. 
I think I have attained a proper form of announcement. Taking the sheet of note paper and giving it to Thomas. Of course, the announcement Philip himself made was quite out of the question. Grace smiles. However, there is mine. She points to the paper. Thomas gives the list to Mrs. Fillmore and moves away. I hope you'll send an announcement to the Dudleys. Mrs. Fillmore, prepared to make the best of things, plaintively reads, Mr. Philip Fillmore and Mrs. Cynthia Dean Carslake announce their marriage May 20th at 3 o'clock, 19A, Washington Square, New York. Replacing the paper on Thomas's salver. It sounds very nice. Thomas returns the paper to Miss Hennage. In my opinion, it barely escapes sounding nasty. However, it is correct. The only remaining question is to whom the announcement should not be sent. Thomas goes out. I consider an announcement of the wedding of two divorced persons to be in the nature of an intimate communication. It not only announces the wedding, it also announces the divorce. Returning to her teacup. The person I shall ask counsel of is Cousin William Sudley. He promised to drop in this afternoon. Oh, we shall hear all about Cairo. William is judicious, Thomas returns. Cousin William will disapprove of the match, unless a winter in Cairo has altered his moral tone. Mr. Sudley. He ushers in William Sudley, a little oldish gentleman. He is and appears thoroughly insignificant but his opinion of the place he occupies in the world is enormous. His manners, voice, presence are all of those of a man of breeding and self-importance. Mrs. Fillmore and Miss Hennage, rising and greeting suddenly, a little tremulously, My, my dear, dear William, William, Thomas withdraws. Suddenly shakes hands with Mrs. Fillmore, soberly glad to see them. How do you do, Mary? Greeting Miss Hennage. A very warm May you are having, Sarah. Grace coming forward to welcome him. Dear Cousin William, Wasn't it warm in Cairo when you left? She will have the strict truth or nothing. Still, on account of Sudley's impeccable respectability, she treats him with more than usual leniency. Sudley sitting down. <sighs> we left Cairo six weeks ago, Grace. So I have had no news since you wrote in February that Philip was engaged. I need not to say, I consider Philip's engagement excessively regrettable. He is a judge upon the Supreme Court bench with a divorced wife. And such a divorced wife. Oh, but Philip has succeeded in keeping everything as quiet as possible. No, my dear. He hasn't succeeded in keeping his former wife as quiet as possible. We had not been in Cairo a week, when who should turn up but Vida Philemon. She went everywhere and did everything no woman should. Oh, what did she do? She did Cleopatra at the tableau at Lord Ellington's. She did Cleopatra. And she did it robbed only in some dire forest material of a nature so transparent that, in fact, she appeared to be draped in moonshine. Miss Hennage indicates the presence of Grace and rises. That was only the beginning. As soon as she heard of Philip's engagement, she gave a dinner in honor of it. Only divorces were asked. And she had a dummy. Yes, my dear, a dummy at the head of the table. He stood for Philip. That is, he said for Philip. Rising and moving to the table. Ah. Dear me. I disapprove of Mrs. Fillimore. Suddenly, taking a cigarette. Of course you do. But has Philip taken to Egyptian cigarettes in order to celebrate my winter at Cairo? Those are Cynthia's. Who is Cynthia? Mrs. Garslake. She's staying here, Cousin William. She'll be down in a minute. You don't mean to tell me? Yes, William. Cynthia is Mrs. Carslake. Mrs. Carslake has no New York house. I disliked the publicity of a hotel in the circumstances, and accordingly, when she became engaged to Philip, I invited her here. And may I ask who Mrs. Carslake is? She was a dean. Suddenly, walking about the room, sorry to be obliged to concede good birth to any but his own blood. Oh, oh well... The deans are extremely nice people. Approaching the table. Was her father J. William Dean? Yes. The family is an old one. J. William Dean's daughter. Surely he lived a very considerable. 
Oh, fifteen or twenty millions. Sudley, determined not to be dazzled. If I remember rightly, she was brought up abroad. In France and England. And I fancy brought up with a very gay set in very gay places. In fact, she is what is called a sporty woman. I might put up with that. But you don't mean to tell me Philip has the, the assurance to marry a woman who has been divorced by... Not at all. Cynthia Carslake divorced her husband. She divorced him. Ah. He seeks the consolation of his tea. The suit went by default. And, my dear William, there are many palliating circumstances. Cynthia was married to Carslake only seven months. There are no... Glancing at Grace. No hostages to fortune. Ahem. Ah, what sort of a young woman is she? Men admire her. She's not conventional. I am bound to say she has behaved discreetly ever since she arrived in this house. Yes, Mary. But I sometimes suspect that she exercises a degree of self-control. She claps on the lead, eh? A new thing that perhaps some day she will boil over. Well, of course, fifteen or twenty millions. But who is Carslake? He owns Cynthia Kay. She's the famous mare. He's Henry Carslake's son. Oh, Henry. Very respectable family. Although I remember his father served the term in the Senate. And so the wedding is to be tomorrow. Tomorrow. Sudley, rising, his respectability to the front when he thinks of the ceremony. Grace rises. Well, my dear Sarah. A respectable family with some means. We must accept her. But on the whole, I think it will be best for me not to see the young woman. My disapprobation would make itself apparent. Grace whispering to Sudley. Cynthia's coming. He doesn't hear. Cynthia comes in, absorbed in reading a newspaper. She is a young creature in her twenties, small and high-bred, full of the love of excitement and sport. Her manner is wide awake and keen, and she is evidently in no fear of the opinion of others. Her dress is exceedingly elegant, but with the elegance of a woman whose chief interests lie in life out of doors. There is nothing hard or masculine in her style, and her expression is youthful and ingenuous. The uncut's modern young woman, eight feet high, with skin like a rhinoceros and manners like a cave dweller, and a bit you of the race track and a divorce court. Cousin William. Uh-oh. Cynthia, reading her newspaper, advances into the room, immersed, excited, trembling. She lowers paper to catch the light. Belmont favorite. Six to one. Rockaway. Rosebud and flying cloud. Slow track. Raw wind. Hmm. Mm hmm. At the half, Rockaway forged ahead when Rosebud under the lash made a bold bid for victory, neck by neck for a quarter, when Flying Cloud slipped by the pair and won on the post by a nose in 149. Oh, I wish I'd seen the dear thing do it. Oh, it's Mr. Sudley. You must think me very rude. How do you do, Mr. Sudley? Going over to Sudley. Sudley bowing without cordiality. Mrs. Gosley. Cynthia pauses, feeling he should say something. As he says nothing, she speaks again. I hope Cairo was delightful. Did you have a smooth voyage? You must permit me, Mrs. Gosley. Oh, please, don't welcome me to the family. All that formal part is over, if you don't mind. I'm one of the tribe now. You're coming to our wedding tomorrow. My dear Mrs. Gosley, I think it might be wiser. Oh, but you must come. I mean to be a perfect wife to Philip and all his relations. That sounds rather miscellaneous, but you know what I mean. I'm afraid. If you don't come, it'll look as if you were not standing by Philip when he's in trouble. You'll come, won't you? But of course you will. I'll come, Mrs. Goslick. Good afternoon. Goodbye, Mary. Good afternoon, Sarah. Grace, dear. At what hour did you say the alimony commences? Miss Hennage, quickly and commandingly to cover his slip. The ceremony is at 3 p.m., William. Sudley walks toward the door. Mrs. Fillmore, with fatigued voice and manner as she rises. I am going to my room to rest a while. She trails slowly from the room. Oh, William, one moment. I entirely forgot. I have the most important social question to ask you. She accompanies him slowly to the door. In regard to the announcements of the wedding, who they shall be sent to and who not. For instance, the Dudleys. 
Deep in their talk, Sudley and Miss Hennage pass out together. Cynthia from the sofa. So that's Cousin William. Grace from the tea-table. Don't you like him? Like him? I love him. He's so generous. He couldn't have received me with more warmth if I'd been a mulatto. Thomas comes in, preceded by Phillimore. Philip Phillimore is a self-centered, short-tempered, imperious member of the respectable fashionables of New York. He is well and solidly dressed, and in manner and speech evidently a man of family. He is accustomed to being listened to in his home circle and from the bench, and it is practically impossible for him to believe that he can make a mistake. Really, you know— Cynthia moves to the table. Philip! Philip nods to Grace absent-mindedly. He is in his working suit and looks tired. He walks into the room silently, goes over to the tea-table, bends over and kisses Cynthia on the forehead, goes to his chair, which Thomas has moved to suit him. He sits and sighs with satisfaction. Ah, uh, Grace! Grace immediately sails out of the room. Well, my dear, I thought I should never extricate myself from the courtroom. You look very debonair. The tea's making. You'll have your glass of sherry. Thanks. Taking it from Thomas and sighing. Ah. I can see it's been a tiring day with you. Philip, his great tussle with the world, leaving him unworsted but utterly spent. Hmm. He gratefully sips his tea. Were the lawyers very long-winded? Prolix to the point of somnolence. It might be affirmed without inexactitude that the prolixity of counsel is the somnolence of the judiciary. I am fatigued. Ah! A little suddenly, awaking to the fact that his orders have not been carried out to the letter. Thomas! My post is not in its usual place. It's here, Philip. Thomas gets it. Thanks, my dear. Opening the post. Ah! This hour with you is... is really the... the one vivid moment of the day. Hmm. Shocking attack by the President on vested interests. Hmm. Too bad. But it's to be expected. The people insisted on electing a desperado to the presidential office. They must take the hold-up that follows. Hmm. His English is lacking in idiom, his spelling and conservatism, his mind in balance, and his character in repose. You seem more fatigued than usual. Another glass of sherry, Philip? Oh, I ought not to. I think you seem a little more tired than usual. Perhaps I am. She pours out sherry. Philip takes glass, but does not sip. Ah, this hour is truly a grateful form of restful excitement. You too find it, eh? He looks at Cynthia. Decidedly. Decidedly what, my dear? Restful. Hm. Perhaps I need the calm more than you do. Over the case today I actually, er, uh, slumbered. I heard myself do it. That's how I know. A dressmaker sued on seven counts. Reading his newspaper. Really? The insanity of the United States Senate? You seem restless, my dear. Ah, uh, um, ha have you seen the evening paper? I see there has been a lightning change in the style or size of hats which ladies— Sweeping a descriptive motion with his hand, he gives the paper to Cynthia, then moves his glass, reads, and sips. The lamp, Thomas. Thomas blows out the alcohol lamp on the tea-table with difficulty. Blows twice. Movement of Philip each time. Blows again. Confound it, Thomas! What are you puffing and blowing at? It's out, ma'am. Yes, sir? You're excessively noisy, Thomas. Yes, sir. I am. We don't need you, Thomas. Yes, ma'am. Puffing and blowing and shaking and quaking like an automobile in an ecstasy. Thomas meekly withdraws. Too bad, Philip. I hope my presence isn't too agitating. Ah, it's just because I value this hour with you, Cynthia. This hour of tea and toast and tranquility. It's quite as if we were married, happily married, already. Cynthia, admitting that married life is a blank, begins to look through paper. Yes, I feel as if we were married already. Ah, it's the calm, you see. The calm. Yes, yes, it's it's the calm. 
Yes, the calm. The halcyon calm of... of second choice. Hmm. He reads and turns over the leaves of the paper. Cynthia reads. There is a silence. After all, my dear, the feeling which I have for you is... is... eh? The market is in a shocking condition of plethora. Hmm. Hmm. And what are you reading? Oh, eh, well, I, uh, I'm just running over the sporting news. Oh. Cynthia, beginning to forget Philip and to remember more interesting matters. I fancied Hermes would come in an easy winner. He came in nowhere. Nonpare was written by Henslow. He's a rotten bad writer. He gets nervous. Philip, still interested in his newspaper. Does he? Hmm. I suppose you do retain an interest in horses and races. Hmm. I trust some day the, uh, law will attract... Oh, here's the report of my opinion in that dressmaker's case, Haggerty versus Fillimore. Was the case brought against you? Oh, no. The suit was brought by Haggerty, Miss Haggerty, a dressmaker, against the... In fact, my dear, against the former Mrs. Fillimore. After a pause, he returns to his reading. How did you decide it? I was obliged to decide in Mrs. Fillimore's favor. Haggerty's plea was preposterous. Did you... did you meet the... the former... No. I often see her at afternoon teas. How did you recognize... Why? Because Mrs. Vida Fillimore's picture appears in every other issue of most of the evening papers, and I must confess I was curious. But I'm sure you find it very painful to meet her again. No... Would you find it so impossible to meet Mr... Philip, don't speak of him. He's nothing. He's a thing of the past. I never think of him. I forget him. That's extraordinarily original of you, to forget him. We each of us have something to forget, Philip. And John Carslake is to me... Well, he's dead. As a matter of fact, my dear, he is dead. Or the next thing to it, for he's bankrupt. Bankrupt? Let's not speak of him. I mean never to see him or think about him or even hear of him. He assents. She reads her paper. He sips his tea and reads his paper. She turns a page, starts and cries out. God bless me! It's a picture of... of... John Carslake? Picture of him and one of me and in the middle between us, Cynthia Kay. Cynthia Kay? My pet riding mare. The best horse he has. She's an angel even in a photograph. Oh! Reading. John Carslake drops a fortune at Saratoga. Rises and walks up and down excitedly. Philip takes the paper and reads. Hem. <clears throat> uh, advertises country place for sale. Stables, famous mare Cynthia K., favorite riding mare of former Mrs. Carslake, who is once again to enter the arena of matrimony with the well-known and highly respected judge of... Don't, don't, Philip, please don't. My dear Cynthia... Take another paper. Here's my post. You'll find nothing disagreeable in the post. Cynthia takes paper. Cynthia, after reading, near the table. It's much worse in the post. John Carslake sells the former Mrs. Carslake's jewels. The famous necklace now at Tiffany's and the sporty ex-husband sells his wife's portrait by Sargent. Philip, I can't stand this. Puts paper on the table. Really, my dear, Mr. Carslake is bound to appear occasionally in print. Or even you may have to meet him. Thomas comes in. I won't meet him. I won't meet him. Every time I hear his name or Cynthia Kay's, I'm so depressed. Thomas, announcing with something like reluctance. Sir, Mr. Fiddler, Mr. Carslake's trainer. Fiddler walks in. He is an English horse trainer, a wide-awake, stocky, well-groomed little cockney. He knows his own mind and sees life altogether through a stable door. Well-dressed for his station and not too young. Fiddler? Tim Fiddler? His coming is outrageous. Note for you, sir. Oh, Fiddler, is that you? Yes, ma'am. How is she? Cynthia Kay. How's Planet Two and the Colts and Goldenrod? How's the whole stable? Are they well? No, ma'am. We're all on the bum. Aside. Ever since you kicked us over. Fiddler. The horse has just simply gone to Egypt since you left, and so's the governor. That will do, Fiddler. I'm waiting for an answer, sir. What is it, Philip? A mere matter of business. Aside to Fiddler. The answer is, Mr. Carslake can come. 
the the coast will be clear. Fiddler goes out. You're not going to see him. But Carslake, my dear, is an old acquaintance of mine. He argues cases before me. I will see that you do not have to meet him. Cynthia walks the length of the room in excited dejection. Matthew comes in. He is a high church clergyman to a highly fashionable congregation. His success is partly due to his social position and partly to his elegance of speech, but chiefly to his inherent amiability, which leaves the sinner in happy peace and smiles on the just and unjust alike. Ah, my dear brother. Matthew. Good afternoon, my dear Cynthia. How charming you look. Cynthia sits down at the tea table. To Cynthia. Ah, why weren't you in your pew yesterday? I preached a most original sermon. He lays his hat and cane on the divan. Thomas aside to Philip. Sir, Mrs. Vida Fillimore's maid called you up on the telephone, and you're to expect Mrs. Fillimore on a matter of business. Here, impossible! To Cynthia. Excuse me, my dear. Philip, much embarrassed, goes out, followed by Thomas. Matthew, approaching Cynthia's chair, happily and pleasantly self-important. No, really, it was a wonderful sermon, my dear. My text was from Paul. It is better to marry than to burn. It was a strictly logical sermon. I argued that, as the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, there is nothing final in nature, not even death. And as there is nothing final in nature, not even death, so then, if death is not final, why should marriage be final? And so the necessity of a divorce. You see? It was an exquisite sermon. All New York was there, and all New York went away happy. Even the sinners, if there were any. I don't often meet sinners, do you? Cynthia, indulgently, in spite of his folly, because he is kind. You are such a dear, delightful pagan. Here's your tea. Matthew taking the tea. Why, my dear, you have a very sad expression. Why not? I feel as if I were of no use in the world when I see sadness on a young face. Only sinners should feel sad. You have committed no sin. Yes, I have. Eh? I committed the unpardonable sin when, when I married for love. One must not marry for anything else, my dear. Why am I marrying your brother? I often wonder why. I wonder why you didn't choose to remain a free woman. I meant to. But a divorcee has no place in society. I felt horridly lonely. I wanted a friend. Philip was ideal as a friend for months. Isn't it nice to bind a friend to you? Matthew setting down his teacup. Yes, yes. To marry a friend. To marry on prudent, sensible grounds a man like Philip. That's what I should have done first, instead of rushing into marriage, because I had a wild, mad, sensitive, sympathetic passion and pain and fury of I don't know what, that almost strangled me with happiness. Ah, ah, in my youth, I, I too. And besides, the day Philip asked me, I was in the dumps. And now, how about marrying only for love? Philip comes back. Ah, oh, my dear, love is not the only thing in the world. Philip half aside. I got there too late. She'd hung up. Who, Philip? A, a lady, uh, uh, Thomas, flurried, comes in with a card on a salver. A card for you, sir. Ahem, <clears throat> Mrs. Fillimore, that was, sir. Eh? She's on the stairs, sir. He nods backward, only to find Vida at his side. He announces her as being the best way of meeting the difficulty. Mrs. Vida Fillimore. Vida comes in slowly, with the air of a spoiled beauty. She stops just inside the door and speaks in a very casual manner. Her voice is languorous and caressing. She is dressed in the excess of the French fashion and carries a daring parasol. She smiles and comes in, undulating to the middle of the room. Tableau. Thomas withdraws. How do you do, Philip? <laughs> Don't tell me I'm a surprise. I had you called up on the phone and I sent up my card. And besides, Philip dear, when you have the... Uh, the habit of the house, as unfortunately I have, you can't treat yourself like a stranger in a strange land. At least, I can't. So here I am. My reason for coming was to ask you about that B&O stock we hold in common. 
to matthew condescendingly the clergy being of a class of unfortunates debarred by profession from the pleasures of the world and how do you do pause she then goes to the real reason of her visit do be polite and present me to your wife to be cynthia cynthia cheerfully with dash putting the table between vida and herself we are delighted to see you mrs phillimore i needn't ask you to make yourself at home but will you have a cup of tea matthew sits near the little table vida to philip my dear she's not in the least what i expected i heard she was a dove she's a very dashing kind of dove to cynthia who moves to the tea-table my dear i'm paying you compliments five lumps and quantities of cream i find single life very thinning to philip calm and ready to be agreeable to any man and how well you're looking it must be the absence of matrimonial cares or is it a new angel in the house it's most amusing to sit in your place and how at home you must feel here in this house where you have made so much trouble i mean tea rises do you know it would be in much better taste if you would take the place you are accustomed to my dear i'm an intruder only for a moment i shan't give you a chance to score off me again but i must thank you dear philip for rendering that decision in my favour i assure you of course you would like to have rendered it against me it was your wonderful sense of justice and that's why i'm so grateful if not to you to your maker philip feels that this is no place for his future wife rises quickly to cynthia cynthia i would prefer that you left us matthew moves to the sofa and sits down cynthia determined not to leave the field first remains seated certainly philip i expect another visitor who oh my dear don't go the truth is i came to see you i feel most cordially towards you and really you know people in our position should meet on cordial terms naturally if people in our position couldn't meet new york society would soon come to an end thomas comes in precisely society's no bigger than a bandbox why it's only moments ago i saw mr carslake walking ah thomas announcing clearly every one changes place in consternation amusement or surprise cynthia moves to leave the room but stops for fear of attracting carslake's attention mr john carslake enter carslake he is a powerful generous personality a man of affairs breezy gay and careless he gives the impression of being game for any fate in store for him his clothes indicate sporting propensities and his taste in waistcoats and ties is brilliant carslake sees first philip and then matthew thomas goes out how do you do good afternoon mr phillimore hello here's the church crossing to matthew and shaking hands he slaps him on the back i had the least idea how are you by george your reverence that was a racy sermon of yours on divorce what was your text sees vida and bows very politely galatians four two the more the merrier or who next as the whale said after jonah cynthia makes a sudden movement upsetting her teacup john faces about quickly and they face each other john gives a frank start a pause holds them mrs carslake bowing i was not aware of the pleasure in store for me i understood you were in the country recovering and moving to her chair perhaps you'll be good enough to make me a cup of tea that is if the teapot wasn't lost in the scrimmage there is another pause cynthia determined to equal him in coolness returns to the tea-tray mr phillimore i came to get your signature in that matter of cox versus keeley i shall be at your service but pray be seated he indicates a chair by the tea-table john sitting beyond but not far from the tea-table and i also understood you to say you wanted a saddle-horse you have a mare called a uh, cynthia k yes she's not for sale oh but she's just the mare i had set my mind on uh, you want her for yourself i uh i sometimes ride she's rather lively for you judge mrs carslake used to ride her you don't care to sell her to me she's a dangerous mare judge and she's as delicate and changeable as a girl i'd hate to leave her in your charge leave her in mine mr carslake mrs carslake knows all about a horse but turning to cynthia 
Uh, Cynthia Kay's got rather tricky of late. You mean to say you think she'd chuck me? I'd hate to have a mare of mine deprive you of a wife, Judge. Rises. Cynthia shows anger. She goes to Saratoga next week, C.W. Vida, who has been sitting and talking to Matthew for lack of a better man, comes to talk to Carslake. C.W.? Creditors willing. I'm sure your creditors are willing. Oh, they're a breezy lot, my creditors. They're giving me a dinner this evening. I regret I'm not a breezy creditor, but I do think you owe it to me to let me see your Cynthia Kay. Can't you lead her around to my house? At what hour, Mrs. Fillmore? Say, eleven? And you, too, might have a leading in my direction. 771 Fifth Avenue. John bows. Cynthia hears and notes this. Your cup of tea, Mr. Carslake. Thanks. Taking his tea and sipping it. Uh, I beg your pardon. You have forgotten, Mrs. Carslake. Very naturally, it has slipped your memory, but I don't take sugar. Cynthia, furious with him and herself, he hands the cup back. She makes a second cup. Sorry. Yes, gout. Gives me a twinge even to sit in the shadow of a sugar maple. First you riot, and then you diet. My dear Matthew, he's a darling. But I feel as if we were all taking tea on the slope of a volcano. Matthew sits down. It occurred to me, Mr. Carslake, you might be glad to find a purchaser for your portrait by Sargent. It's not my portrait. It's a portrait of Mrs. Carslake. And to tell you the truth, the sergeant's a good fellow, I've made up my mind to keep it, to remember the artist by. Cynthia is wounded by this. Hmm. Cynthia hands a second cup to John. Your cup of tea, Mr. Carslake. John, rising and taking the tea with courteous indifference. Thanks. Sorry to trouble you. He drinks the cup of tea standing by the tea table. You're selling your country place? If I was long of hair, I'd sell that. You're not really selling your stable. John finishes his tea, places the empty cup on the tea table, and reseats himself. Every gelding I've got. Seven foals and a donkey. I don't mean the owner. How did you ever manage to come such a cropper? Streak of blue luck. I don't see how it's possible. You would if you'd been there. You remember the head man? Sitting down. Bloke? Of course. Well, his wife divorced him for beating her over the head with a bottle of Fowler's Solution, and it seemed to prey on his mind. He sold me... Sold a race? About ten races, I guess. Just because he'd beaten his wife? No, because she divorced him. Well, I can't see why that should prey on his mind. Well, I have known men that it stroked the wrong way. But he cost me eighty thousand, and then Urbanity ran third in the thousand-dollar stakes for two-year-olds at Belmont. I never had faith in that horse. And, of course, it never rains monkeys, but it pours gorillas. So, when I was down at St. Louis on the 5th, I laid seven to three on fraternity. Crazy. Crazy. I don't see it. With her record, she ought to have romped it an easy winner. She hasn't the stamina. Look at her barrel. Well, anyhow, geranium finished me. You didn't lay odds on geranium. Why not? She's my own mare. Oh. Streak of bad luck. Streak of poor judgment. Do you remember the day you rode Billy at a six-foot stone wall, and he stopped and you didn't, and there was a hornet's nest on the other side? And I remember you were hot just because I said you showed poor judgment. She laughs at the memory, a general movement of disapproval. She remembers the situation. I beg your pardon. Matthew rises to meet Vida hastily. It seems to me that horses are like the fourth gospel. Any conversation about them becomes animated, almost beyond the limits of the urbane. Vida, disgusted by such plainness of speech, rises and goes to Philip, who waves her to a chair. I regret that you have endured such reverses, Mr. Carslake. John quietly bows. You haven't mentioned your new English horse, Pantomime. What did he do at St. Louis? John, sitting down. Fell away and ran fifth. Too bad. Was he fully acclimated? Ah, well. We always differed, you remember, on the time needed... Matthew, coming over to Cynthia, and speaking to carry off the situation as well as to get a tip. Isn't there a, a, a race tomorrow at Belmont Park? Yes. I'm going down in my auto. Oh. And what animal shall you prefer? I'm backing Carmencita. Cynthia, with a gesture of despair. Carmencita? Carmencita? Matthew returns to Vita's side. 
You may remember we always differed on Carmen Sita. But there's no room for difference. She's a wild, headstrong, dissatisfied, foolish little filly. The deuce couldn't ride her. She'd shied her own shadow, Carmen Sita. Oh, very well, then. I'll wager you, and I'll give you odds, too. Decorum will come in first, and I'll lay three to one he'll beat Carmen Sita by five lengths. How's that for fair? Sorry I'm not flush enough to take you. Philip, dear, you lend John enough for the wager. Um, really? It's a sporty idea, Mrs. Carslake, but perhaps in the circumstances... In what circumstances? <laughs> it does seem to me there is a certain impropriety... Oh, I forgot. When horses are in the air... It's the fourth gospel, you see. Thomas comes in with a letter on a salver, which he hands to Philip. You are quite right, Philip. The fact is, seeing Mr. Carslake again, he seems to me as much a stranger as if I were meeting him for the first time. Matthew, aside to Vida. We are indeed taking tea on the slope of a volcano. Vida, about to go, but thinking she will have a last word with John. I'm sorry your fortunes are so depressed, Mr. Carslake. Philip, looking at the card that Thomas has just brought in. Who in the world is Sir Wilfred Cates Darby? There is a general stir. Oh, eh? Cates Darby? Philip opens the letter which Thomas has brought with the card. That's the English chap I bought pantomime of. Philip to Thomas. Show Sir Wilfred Cates Darby in. Thomas goes out. The prospect of an Englishman with a handle to his name changes Vita's plans, and, instead of leaving the house, she goes to sofa and poses there. He's a good fellow, Judge. Place near Epsom. Reader. Over here to take a shy at our races. Thomas opening the door and announcing, Sir Wilfred Cates Darby. Enter Sir Wilfred Cates Darby. He is a high-bred, sporting Englishman. His manner, his dress, and his diction are the perfection of English elegance. His movements are quick and graceful. He talks lightly and with ease. He is full of life and unsmiling good temper. Philip to Sir Wilfrid and referring to the letter of introduction in his hand. I am Mr. Phillimore. I am grateful to Stanhope for giving me the opportunity of knowing you, Sir Wilfrid. I fear you find it warm? Sir Wilfrid, delicately mopping his forehead. Ah, oh, well, ah, uh, warm? No, hot, yes. Juiced extraordinary climate yours, you know, Mr. Fillimore. Permit me to present you to... The unconventional situation pulls him up short. It takes him a moment to decide how to meet it. He makes up his mind to pretend that everything is as usual and presents Cynthia first. Mrs. Carslake. Sir Wilfred bows, surprised and doubtful. How do you do? And to Mrs. Fillimore. Vita bows nonchalantly, but with a view to catching Sir Wilfred's attention. Sir Wilfred bows and looks from her to Philip. My brother, and Mr. Carslake, you know. How do, my boy? Half aside to John. No idea you had such a charming little wife. What? Eh? Carslake moves to speak to Matthew and Philip in the further room. You'll have a cup of tea, Sir Wilfred. Thanks awfully. I'd no idea old John had a wife. The rascal never told me. Cynthia, pouring tea and facing the facts. I'm not Mr. Carslake's wife. Oh, eh? I see. Vida, who has been ready for some time to speak to him. Sir Wilfred, I'm sure no one has asked you how you like our country. Sir Wilfred, going to Vida and standing by her at the sofa. Oh, well, as to climate and horses, I say nothing. But I like your American humour. I'm acquiring it for home purposes. Aren't you going to acquire an American girl for home purposes? The more narrowly I look at the agreeable project in the face, the more I like it. Ought not to say that in the presence of your husband. He casts a look at Philip, who has gone into the next room. He's not my husband. Oh, eh? My brain must be boiled. You are Mrs. A. Ah, of course. Now I see. I got the wrong names. I thought you were Mrs. Fillimore and that nice girl, Mrs. Carslake. You're deucedly lucky to be Mrs. Carslake. John's a prime sort, I say. Have you and he got any kids? How many? He's not my husband. Phew! Awfully hot in here. 
Who the deuce is John's wife? He hasn't any. Who's Philemore's wife? He hasn't any. Thanks. Fearfully. To Matthew, whom he approaches, suspecting himself of having lost his wits. Would you excuse me, my dear and reverend sir? You're a churchman and all that. Would you mind straightening me out? Certainly, Sir Wilfred. Is it a matter of doctrine? Oh, damn. Oh, beg your pardon. No, it's not words. It's women. Women? It's divorce. Now, the lady on the sofa... Was my brother's wife. He divorced her. Incompatibility. Rhode Island. The lady at the tea table was Mr. Carslake's wife. She divorced him. Desertion. Sioux Falls. One moment. She is about to marry my brother. I'm out. Thought I never would be. Thanks. Vita laughs. Have you got me straightened out yet? Straight as a die, I say. You had lots of fun, didn't you? Returning to his position by the sofa. And so she is Mrs. John Carslake? Do you like her? My word. Eh? She's a box of ginger. You haven't seen many American women. Oh, haven't I? If you'll pay me a visit tomorrow, at twelve, you shall meet a most charming young woman who has seen you once and who admires you. Ah. Oh. I'm there. What? 771 Fifth Avenue. 771 Fifth Avenue at twelve. At twelve. Thanks. Indicating Cynthia. She's a thoroughbred. You can see that with one eye shut. Twelve. Shaking hands. Awfully good of you to ask me. He joins John. I say, my boy, your former's an absolute certainty. To Cynthia. I hear you're about to marry Mr. Fillimore, Mrs. Carslake. Carslake crosses to Vida, and together they move to the sofa and sit down. Tomorrow, 3 p.m., Sir Wilfred. Afraid I've run into a sort of family party, eh? The past and the future. Awfully chic way you Americans have of asking your divorced husbands and wives to drop in, you know? Celebrate a christening, or the new bride, or... Do you like your tea strong? Middling. Sugar? One. Lemon? Just torture a lemon over it. He makes a gesture as of twisting a lemon peel. She hands him his tea. Thanks. So you do it tomorrow at three? At three, Sir Wilfred. Sorry. Why are you sorry? Hate to see a pretty woman married. Might marry her myself. Oh, but I'm sure you don't admire American women. Admire you, Mrs. Carslake. Not enough to marry me, I hope. Marry you in a minute. Say the word. Marry you now, here. You don't think you ought to know me a little before? Know you? Do know you. Cynthia, covering her hair with her handkerchief. What color is my hair? Pshaw. Sure. You see, you don't know whether I'm a chestnut or a strawberry roan. In the States, we think a few months of friendship is quite necessary. Few months of moonshine? Never was a friend to a woman. Thank God, in all my life. Oh, oh, oh. Might as well talk about being a friend to a whiskey and soda. A woman has a soul, Sir Wilfred. Well, good whiskey is spirits. Dozens of souls. You are so gross. Sir Wilfred, changing his seat for one at the tea table. Gross? Not a bit. Friendship between the sexes is all fudge. I'm no friend to a rose in my garden. I don't call it friendship. Hey, hey. A warm, starry night, moonbeams and ilex trees, and a spirit who knows how. And all that, eh? You make me feel awfully poetical, you know. Philip comes toward them, glances nervously at Cynthia and Sir Wilfrid, and walks away again. What's the matter? But I say, poetry aside, do you, eh? Does he, you know, is he, does he go to the head? Sir Wilfrid, Mr. Fillimore is my sober second choice. Did you ever kiss him? I'll bet he finds you for contempt of court. Look here, Mrs. Carslake. If you're marrying a man you don't care about... Really? Well, I don't offer myself. Oh. Not this instant. Ah. But let me drop in tomorrow at ten. What country and state of affairs do you think you have landed in? New York, by Jove. 
been to school too. New York is bounded on the north, south, east and west by the state of divorce. Come, come, Mrs. Carslake. I like your country. You've no fear and no respect. No can't and lots of can. Here you all are, you see. Your former husband and your new husband's former wife. Sounds like Ollendorf. Hey, eh? so there you are, you see. But joking apart, why do you marry him? Oh, well, marry him if you must. You can run around the corner and get a divorce afterwards. I believe you think they throw one in with an ice cream soda. Damn, my dear lady, a marriage in your country is no more than a... a... what do you call them? A thank you, ma'am. That's what an American marriage is, a thank you, ma'am. Bump, bump, and you're over it, and on to the next. You're an odd fish. What? I believe I like you. Of course you do. You'll see me when I call tomorrow. At ten? We'll run down to Belmont Park, eh? Don't be absurd. Vida has finished her talk with John and breaks in on Sir Wilfrid, who has hung about Cynthia too long to suit her. Tomorrow at twelve, Sir Wilfrid. Twelve. Vida shaking hands with John. Don't forget, Mr. Carslake, eleven o'clock tomorrow. John bowing assent. I won't. Vida coming over to Cynthia. Oh, Mrs. Carslake, I've ordered Tiffany to send you something. It's a sugar bowl to sweeten the matrimonial lot. I suppose nothing would induce you to call. Thanks, no. That is, is Cynthia Kay really to be there at eleven? I'd give a gold mine to see her again. Do come. If Mr. Carslake will accommodate me by his absence. Dear Mr. Carslake, you'll have to change your hour. Sorry, I'm not able to. I can't come later, for I'm to be married. It's not as bad as that with me, but I'm to be sold up. Sheriff, you know, can come later than eleven. Vida to Cynthia. Any hour but eleven, dear. Mrs. Phillimore, I shall call on you at eleven to see Cynthia Kay. I thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon. Vida aside to John, crossing to speak quietly to him. It's mere bravado. She won't come. You don't know her. There is a pause and general embarrassment. Sir Wilfrid uses his eyeglass. John angry. Cynthia triumphant. Matthew embarrassed. Vida irritated. Philip puzzled. Everybody is at odds. Sir Wilfrid, for the first time a witness to the pretty complications of divorce. To Matthew. Do you have it as warm as this ordinarily? It's not so much the heat as the humidity. John looks at watch and, relieved, glad to be off. I shall be late for my creditor's dinner. Creditor's dinner? Fifteen of my sporting creditors have arranged to give me a blowout at Sherry's, and I'm expected right away or sooner. And by the way, I was to bring my friends, if I had any. So now's the time to stand by me. Mrs. Fillmore? Of course. Mrs. Carslake? Oh, I beg your pardon. Judge? Philip declines. No? Sir Wilfred? I'm with you. John to Matthew. Your Grace? I regret. Is it the custom for creditors? Come on, Sir Wilfred. Thomas opens door. Good night, Judge. Your Grace? Is it the custom? Hang the custom. Come on, I'll show you a gang of creditors worth having. Sir Wilfred and John go out, arm in arm, preceded by Vida. Matthew crosses the room, smiling as if pleased in a Christian way, with this display of generous gaiety. He stops short suddenly and looks at his watch. Good gracious! I had no idea the hour was so late. I've been asked to a meeting with Maryland and Iowa to talk over the divorce situation. He leaves the room quickly, and his voice is heard in the hall. Good afternoon! Good afternoon! Cynthia is evidently much excited. The outer door slams. Philip comes down slowly. Cynthia stands, her eyes wide, her breathing visible, until Philip speaks, when she seems suddenly to realize her position. There is a long pause. I have seldom witnessed a more amazing cataclysm of jocundity. Of course, my dear, this has all been most disagreeable for you. Yes, yes, yes. I saw how much it shocked your delicacy. Outrageous! Philip sits down. Do be seated, Cynthia. Taking up the paper, quietly. Very odd sort of an Englishman, that Kate's Darby. Sir Wilfred? Oh, yes. Philip settles down to the paper. 
to herself. Outrageous! I've a great mind to go at eleven, just as I said I would. Do sit down, Cynthia. What? What? You make me so nervous. Sorry, sorry. She sits down and, seeing the paper, takes it, looking at the picture of John Carslake. Ah, now that I see him, I don't wonder you couldn't stand him. There's a kind of, a uh, spontaneous inebriety about him. He is incomprehensible. If I might with reverence cross-question the Creator, I would say to him, Sir, to what end or purpose did you create Mr. John Carslake? I believe I should obtain no adequate answer. However, at last we have peace. And the post. Philip, settling himself, reads his paper. Cynthia, glancing at her paper, occasionally looks across at Philip. Forget the dust of the arena, the prolixity of counsel, the involuntary fatuity of things in general. After a pause, he goes on with his reading. Compose yourself. Miss Hannage, Mrs. Fillimore, and Grace come in. Cynthia sighs without letting her sigh be heard. She tries to compose herself. She glances at the paper, and then, hearing Miss Hennage, starts slightly. Miss Hennage and Mrs. Fillimore stop at the table. Miss Hennage, carrying a sheet of paper. There, my dear Mary, is the announcement as I have now reworded it. I took William's suggestion. Mrs. Fillimore takes and casually reads it. I also put the case to him, and he was of the opinion that the announcement should be sent only to those people who are really in society. She sits near the table. Cynthia braces herself to bear the Fillimore conversation. I wish you'd make an exception of the Dudleys. Cynthia rises and moves to the chair by the table. And of course that excludes the Oppenheims, the Vance Browns. It's just as well to be exclusive. I do wish you'd make an exception of Lena Dudley. We might, of course, include those new Gerardos, and possibly, possibly the Paddingtons. I do wish you would take in Lena Dudley. They are now sitting. The mother Dudley is as common as a charwoman, and not nearly as clean. Ah, I certainly am fatigued. Cynthia begins to slowly crush the newspaper she has been reading with both hands, as if the effort of self-repression were too much for her. We shall have to ask the Dudleys sooner or later to dine, Mary, because of the elder girl's marriage to that dissolute French marquis. I don't like common people any more than I like common cats, and of course in my time— I think I shall include the Dudleys. You think you'll include the Dudleys? Yes. I think I will include the Dudleys. Here Cynthia's control breaks down. Driven desperate by their chatter, she has slowly rolled her newspaper into a ball, and at this point tosses it violently to the floor and bursts into hysterical laughter. Why, my dear Cynthia, compose yourself. What is the matter, Cynthia? Why, Mrs. Carslake, what is the matter? Mrs. Carslake. End of Act One Act Two of the New York Idea by Langdon Mitchell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two. Scene: Mrs. Vida Fillimore's boudoir. The room is furnished to please an empty-headed, pleasure-loving, and fashionable woman. The furniture, the ornaments, what pictures there are, all witness to taste up to date. Two French windows open on to a balcony, from which the trees of Central Park can be seen. There is a table between them, a mirror, a scent bottle, etc., upon it. On the right upstage is a door, on the right downstage another door. A lady's writing table stands between the two, nearer center of stage. There is another door upstage, below it an open fireplace filled with potted plants, and irons, etc., not in use. Over it is a tall mirror. On the mantelpiece are a French clock, candelabra, vases, etc. On a line with the fireplace is a lounge, gay with silk pillows. A florist's box, large and long, filled with American beauty roses, rests on a low table near the head of the lounge. Small tables and light chairs where needed. Benson, alone in the room, is looking critically about her. 
She is a neat and pretty little English lady's maid in black silk and a thin apron. Still surveying the room, she moves here and there, and, her eyes lighting on the box of flowers, she goes to the door of Vita's room and speaks to her. Yes, ma'am. The flowers have come. She holds open the door through which Vita, in a morning gown, comes in slowly. She is smoking a cigarette in as aesthetic a manner as she can, and is evidently turned out in her best style for conquest. Terribly garish light, Benson. Pull down the— Benson, obeying, partly pulls down the shade. Lower still. That will do. As she speaks, she goes about the room, giving the tables a push here and the chairs a jerk there, and generally arranging the vases and ornaments. Men hate a clutter of chairs and tables. Stopping and taking up a hand mirror from the table, she faces the windows. I really think I'm too pale for this light. Yes, ma'am. Benson goes out for the rouge, and Vita seats herself at the table. There is a knock at the door. Come. Brooks comes in. Brooks, an ultra-English footman, in plush and calves. Any orders, milady? Oh, of course. You're the new— Footman, milady. Your name? Brooks, milady. Benson returns with the rouge. Vita, carefully giving instructions while she keeps her eyes on the glass, and is rouged by Benson. Brooks, I am at home to Mr. Carslake at eleven, not to anyone else till twelve, when I expect Sir Wilfred Cates Darby. Brooks, watching Benson, is inattentive. Yes, my lady. And I regret to inform you, Brooks, that in America there are no ladies, except sales ladies. Yes, my lady. I am at home to no one but the two names I have mentioned. Brooks bows and exits. She dabs on rouge while Benson holds glass. Is the men's club room in order? Perfectly, ma'am. Whiskey and soda? Yes, ma'am, and the tick has been mended. The British sporting papers arrived this morning. Vida, looking at her watch, which lies on the dressing table. My watch has stopped. Benson, glancing at the French clock on the chimney piece. Five to eleven, ma'am. Hmm, hmm, I shall be caught. Rising. The box of roses, Benson. Benson brings the box of roses, uncovers the flower, and places them at Vita's side. My gloves, the clippers, and the vase. Each of these things Benson places in turn within Vita's range where she sits on the sofa. She has the long box of roses at her side on a small table, a vase of water on the floor by her side. She cuts the stems and places the roses in the vase. When she feels that she has reached a picturesque position, in which any onlooker would see in her a creature filled with the love of flowers and of her fellow man, she says, There. The door opens and Brooks comes in. Vida nods to Benson. Sir John Carslake. John, dressed in very knobby riding togs, comes in gaily and forcibly. Benson withdraws as he enters and is followed by Brooks. Vida, from this moment on, is busied with her roses. Is that really you, Sir John? I see now where we Americans are going to get our titles. Good morning. You look as fresh as paint. He lays his gloves and riding crop on the table and takes a chair. I hope you don't mean that. I never flattered myself for a moment you'd come. You're riding Cynthia Kay. Fiddler's going to lead her round here in ten minutes. Cigars and cigarettes. Scotch. Indicating a small table. Scotch goes up quickly to table and helps himself to scotch and seltzer. And now do tell me all about her. Putting in her last roses, she keeps one rosebud in her hand, of a size suitable for a man's buttonhole. Ah, oh, she's an adorable creature. Delicate, high-bred, sweet-tempered. Sweet-tempered? Oh, you're describing the horse. By her, I meant— Cynthia Carr's Lake? I'd rather talk about the last tornado— he drops moodily into a chair. There is only one thing I want to talk about, and that is you. Why were you unhappy? Why does a dollar last such a short time? Why did you part? Do you ever see a schooner towed by a tug? Well, I parted from Cynthia for the same reason the hawser parts from the tug. I couldn't stand the tug. Ah. Awful cheerful morning chat. I must hear the story, for I'm anxious to know why I've taken such a fancy to you. Why do I like you? I won't tell you. It would flatter you too much. Tell me. There's a rose for you. 
giving him the one she has in her hand. I want more than a rose. You refuse to tell me? There's nothing to tell. We met, we loved, we married, we parted. Or at least we wrangled and jangled. <sighs> ha! Why weren't we happy? Don't ask me why. It may have been partly my fault. Never. But I believe it's all in the way a girl's brought up. Our girls are brought up to be ignorant of life. They're, they're ignorant of life. Life is a joke, and marriage is a picnic, and a man is a shawl strap. Upon my soul, Cynthia Dean. Nope, I can't tell you. Please tell me. Well, she was an heiress, an American heiress, and she'd been taught to think that marriage meant burnt almonds and moonshine and a yacht and three automobiles, and she thought... I don't know what she thought, but I tell you, Mrs. Fillimore, marriage is three parts love and seven parts forgiveness of sins. He continues restlessly to pace the floor as he speaks of Cynthia. She never loved you. Yes, she did. For six or seven months there was not a shadow between us. It was perfect, and then one day she went off like a pistol shot. I had a piece of law work and couldn't take her to see flashlight race the Maryland mare. The case meant a big fee, big kudos, and in sales Cynthia, flashlight mad. And will I put on my hat and take her? No. And bang, she goes off like a stick of dynamite. What did I marry her for? And words, pretty high words until she got mad when she threw over a chair and said, Oh well, marriage was a failure, or it was with me, so I said she'd better try somebody else. She said she would, and marched out of the room. But she came back. She came back, but not as you mean. She stood at the door and said, Jack, I shall divorce you. Then she came over to my study table, dropped her wedding ring on my law papers, and went out. The door shut. I laughed. The front door slammed. I damned. After a silence, moving abruptly to the window. She never came back. He turns away and then, recovering, moves toward Vita, who catches his hands. She's broken your heart. John, taking a chair by the lounge. Oh, no. You'll never love again. Try me. Try me. Ah, no, Mrs. Fillimore. I shall laugh, live, love, and make money again. And let me tell you one thing. I'm going to wrap her one over the knuckles. She's had a stick of a Connecticut lawyer, and he, well, to cut a legal story short, since Mrs. Carslake has been in Europe, I have been quietly testing the validity of the decree of divorce. Perhaps you don't understand. Oh, about a divorce, everything. I shall hear by this evening whether the divorce will stand or not. But it's today at three she marries. You won't let her commit bigamy. John shaking his head. Oh, I don't suppose I'd go as far as that. It may be the divorce will hold, but anyway I hope never to see her again. He sits down beside her so that their faces are now directly opposite. Taking advantage of the close range, her eyes, without loss of time, open a direct fire. Oh, my poor boy. She has broken your heart. Believing that this is her psychological moment, she lays her hand on his arm, but draws it back as soon as he attempts to take it. Now don't make love to me. Why not? Because I like you too much. I might give in and take a notion to like you still more. Please do. Jack, I believe you'd be a lovely lover. Try me. You charming, tempting, delightful fellow. I could love you without the least effort in the world, but no. Ah, oh, well now, seriously. Between two people who have suffered and made their own mistakes. But you see, you don't really love me. Cynthia, Vida, no man can sit beside you and look into your eyes without feeling. Oh, that's not love. That's simply... <laughs> well, my dear Jack, it's beginning at the wrong end. And the truth is, you hate Cynthia Carslake with such a whole-hearted hate that you haven't a moment to think of any other woman. I hate her! Jack. Jack. I could be as foolish about you as... Oh, as foolish as anything, my dear. And perhaps some day, perhaps some day you'll come to me and say, Vida, I am totally indifferent to Cynthia. And then... And then? Then, perhaps... You and I may join hands and stroll together into the Garden of Eden. It takes two to find the Garden of Eden, you know. And once we're on the inside, we'll lock the gate. And lose the key under a rose-bush. Under a rose-bush. There is a very soft knock at which John starts up quickly. 
come. Brooks comes in, with Benson close at his heels. My lady, Sir Wilf. Benson stops him with a sharp movement and turns toward Vida. Your dressmaker, ma'am. Benson waves Brooks to go, and Brooks very haughtily complies. My dressmaker, Benson? Oh, of course. Show her up. Mr. Karslick, you won't mind for a few minutes using my men's club room. Benson will show you. You'll find cigars and the ticker, sporting papers, whiskey. And if you want anything special, just phone down to my chef. John, looking at his watch. How long? Half a cigar. Benson will call you. Don't make it too long. You see, there's my sheriff's sale on at twelve, and those races this afternoon. Fiddler will be here in ten minutes, remember? The door opens. Run along. John leaves, and Vida, instantly practical, makes a broad gesture to Benson. Everything just as it was, Benson. Benson whisks the roses out of the vase and replaces them in the box. She gives Vida scissors and empty vases, and, when Vida finds herself in precisely the same position which preceded John's entrance, she says, There. Brooks comes in as Vida takes a rose from the basket. Your ladyship's dressmaker, milady. Enter Sir Wilfrid in morning suit, boutonniere, etc. Is that really you, Sir Wilfrid? I never flattered myself for an instant that you'd remember to come. Come? Of course I come. Keen to come see you. By Jove, you know, you look as pink and white as a hunt in morning. You'll smoke? Awfully long fingers you have. Wish I was a rose or a ring or a pair of shears, I say. Do you ever notice what a devil of a fellow I am for originality? What? You've got a delicate little den up here. Not so much low living and high thinking as low lights and no thinking at all, I hope, eh? By this time, Vida has filled a vase with roses and rises to sweep by him and, if possible, make another charming picture to his eyes. Vida, gliding gracefully past him. You don't mind my moving about? Not if you don't mind my watching. Sitting down on the sofa. And saying how well you do it? It's most original of you to come here this morning. I don't quite see why you did. She places the roses here and there as if to see their effect, and leaves them on a small table near the door through which her visitors entered. Oh, I saw that you admired her. And of course she did say she was coming here at eleven. But that was only bravado. She won't come. And besides, I've given orders to admit no one. May I ask you? And indeed, if she came now, Mr. Carslake is gone, and her sole object in coming was to make him uncomfortable. She moves toward the table, stopping a half-minute at the mirror to see that she looks as she wishes to look. Very dangerous symptom, too, that passionate desire to make one's former husband unhappy. But I can't believe that your admiration for Cynthia Carslake is so warm that it led you to pay me this visit a half-hour too early in the hope of seeing. I say, would you mind stopping a moment? I'm not an American, you know. I was brought up not to interrupt. But you Americans, it's different with you. If somebody didn't interrupt you, you'd go on forever. My point is, you come to see Cynthia. I came hoping to see... Cynthia. But I would have come even if I'd known. I don't believe it. Give you my word, I... You're here to see her, and of course... May I have the, uh, the floor? I was jolly well bowled over with Mrs. Carslake, I admit that. And I hope to see her here, but... You had another object in coming. In fact, you came to see Cynthia, and you came to see me. What I really long to know is, why you wanted to see me. For, of course, Cynthia's to be married at three. And if she wasn't, she wouldn't have you. Well, I mean to jolly well ask her. To be your wife? Why not? And you came here to my house in order to ask her? Oh, but that's only my first reason for coming, you know. Well, now I am curious. What is the second? Are you feeling pretty robust? I don't know. Will you have something? Then I'll tell you. Can't I support the news without... Mrs. Fillimore, you see, it's this way. Whenever you're lucky, you're too lucky. Now, Mrs. Carslake is a nipper, and no mistake, but as I told you, the very same evening and house where I saw her... He attempts to take her hand. What? That's it. You're over. He suggests, with his right hand, the movement of a horse taking a hurdle. You don't really mean... I mean, I stayed awake for an hour last night thinking about you. But you've just told me that Cynthia... Well, she did. She did bowl my wicket, but so did you. 
don't you think there's a limit to— Now see here, Mrs. Fillimore, you and I are not bottle babies, eh? Are we? You've been married, and I— I've knocked about. And we both know there's a lot of stuff I've talked about. Eh, eh? Well, you know, the one and only, that a fella can't be awfully well smashed by two at the same time. Don't you know? All rubbish, you know it. And the proof of the pudding's in the eating. I am. May I ask where I come in? Well now, Mrs. Fillimore, I'll be frank with you. Cynthia's my favourite, but you're running her a close second in the popular esteem. <laughs> what a delightful, original, fantastic person you are. I knew you'd take it that way. And what next, pray? Oh, just the usual eh, thing. The, uh, the same question. Don't you know? Will you have me if she don't? <laughs> and you call that the same old usual question? Yes, I know, but... But will you? I sail in the week. We can take the same boat. And, eh, uh, eh... Uh, my dear missus, mayn't I say, Vida, I'd like to see you at the head of my table. With Cynthia at the foot? Never mind, Mrs. Carslake. I admire her. She's... But you have your own points. And you're here. And so am I. Damn, I offer myself and my affections, and I'm no icicle, my dear. Tell you that for a fact. And, and in fact, what's your answer? Vida sighs and shakes her head. Make it yes, I say. You know, my dear Vida. He catches her hands. Vida drawing them from his. Unhand me, dear villain, and sit further away from your second choice. What can I say? I'd rather have you for a lover than any man I know. You must be a lovely lover. I oh, am? Yeah? He makes a second effort to catch her fingers. Will you kindly go further away and be good? Look here. If you say yes, we'll be married. In a month? Oh, no. This evening. This evening? And sail in the same boat with you? And shall we sail to the Garden of Eden and stroll into it and lock the gate on the inside and then lose the key? Under a rose-bush? Yes, yes, I say. That's too clever for me. He draws nearer to her to bring the understanding to a crisis. Vida interrupted by a soft knock. My maid, come! Sir Wilfrid, swinging out of his chair and moving to the sofa. Eh? Benson, coming in and approaching Vida. The new footman, ma'am. He's made a mistake. He's told the lady you're at home. What lady? Mrs. Carslake, and she's on the stairs, ma'am. And show her in. Sir Wilfrid has been turning over the roses. On hearing this, he faces about with a long-stemmed one in his hand. He subsequently uses it to point his remarks. Sir Wilfrid to Benson, who stops. One moment. To Vida. I say, eh? I'd rather not see her. But you came here to see her. I'd rather not, eh? I fancied I'd find you here and her together. But her, finding me, with you look so deuced intimate. No one else, do you see? I believe she'd draw conclusions. Pardon me, ma'am, but I hear Brooks coming. Sir Wilfrid to Benson. Hold the door. So you don't want her to know? Sir Wilfrid to Vida. Be a good girl now. Run me off somewhere. Vida to Benson. Show Sir Wilfrid the men's room. Brooks comes in. The men's room? Ah, oh, eh. Vida beckoning him to go at once. Sir Wil... He hesitates, then, as Brooks advances, he flings off with Benson. Lady Carslake, milady. Anything more inopportune. I never dreamed she'd come. Cynthia comes in veiled. As she walks quickly into the room, Vita greets her languorously. My dear Cynthia, you don't mean to say... Yes, I've come. Do take off your veil. Is no one here? Won't you sit down? Thanks, no. That is... Yes, thanks. Yes. You haven't answered my question. Cynthia waves her hand through the haze, glances suspiciously at the smoke, and looks about for the cigarette. My dear, what makes you imagine that anyone's here? You've been smoking. Oh, puffing away. Cynthia sees the glasses. And drinking. A pair of drinks? Her eyes lighting on John's gloves on the table at her elbow. Do they fit you, dear? Vita smiles. Cynthia picks up the crop and looks at it and reads her own name. Jack, from Cynthia. Yes, dear, it's Mr. Carslake's crop, but I'm happy to say he left me a few minutes ago. He left the house. Vita smiles. I wanted to see him. 
To quarrel? I wanted to see him. And I sent him away because I didn't want you to repeat the scene of last night in my house. Cynthia looks at Crop and is silent. Well, I can't stay. I'm to be married at three, and I had to play truant to get here. Benson comes in. Benson to Vida. There's a person, ma'am, on the sidewalk. What person, Benson? A person, ma'am, with a horse. It's Fiddler with Cynthia Kay. She walks rapidly to the window and looks out. Vida to Benson. Tell the man I'll be down in five minutes. Cynthia looking down from the balcony with delight. Oh, there she is! Vida aside to Benson. Go to the club room, Benson, and say to the two gentlemen I can't see them at present. I'll send for them when— I hear someone coming. Quick! Benson leaves the door, which opens, and John comes in slowly, carelessly. Vida whispers to Benson. Benson moving close to John and whispering. Beg pardon? Go back. I beg pardon? Go back. Can't. I have a date. With the sheriff. Please use your eyes. I am using my eyes. Don't you see there's a lovely creature in the room? Of course there is. Hush. But what I want to know is... Hush. Is when we're to stroll in the Garden of Eden. Hush. And lose the key. To put a stop to this, she lightly tosses her handkerchief into his face. By George! Talk about Attar of Roses! Cynthia at window, excited and moved at seeing her mare once more. Oh, she's a darling! A perfect darling! John starts up. He sees Cynthia at the same instant that she sees him. Oh, I didn't know you were here. I came to see you. Oh, pray feel at home, Cynthia, dear. Stopping by the door to her bedroom, to John. When I've a nice street frock on, I'll ask you to present me to Cynthia Kay. Vida opens the door and goes out. Cynthia and John involuntarily exchange glances. Of course, I told you yesterday I was coming here. And I was to deny myself the privilege of being here? Yes. And you guessed I would do that? No. What? Jack. I mean, Mr. Carslake. No, I mean Jack. I came because, well, you see, it's my wedding day, and, and, I... I was rude to you last evening. I'd like to apologize and make peace with you before I go. Before you go to your last long home. I came to apologize. But you'll remain to quarrel. I will not quarrel. No, and I'm only here for a moment. I'm to be married at three and just look at the clock. Besides, I told Philip I was going to Louise's shop, and I did, on the way here. But you see, if I stay too long, he'll telephone Louise and find I'm not there, and he might guess I was here. So you see I'm risking a scandal. And now, Jack, see here. I lay my hand on the table, I'm here on the square, and what I want to say is why— Jack, even if we have made a mess of our married life, let's put by anger and pride. It's all over now and can't be helped. So let's be human, let's be reasonable, and let's be kind to each other. Won't you give me your hand? John refuses. I wish you every happiness. John, turning away, the past rankling. I had a client once, a murderer. He told me he murdered the man, and he told me, too, that he never felt so kindly to anybody as he did to that man after he'd killed him. Jack! You murdered my happiness. I won't recriminate. And now I must put by anger and pride. I do, but not self-respect, not a just indignation, not the facts and my clear memory of them. Jack! No! Cynthia, with growing emotion and holding out her hand. I give you one more chance. Yes, I'm determined to be generous. I forgive everything you ever did to me. I'm ready to be friends. I wish you every happiness and every... every horse in the world. I can't do more than that. She offers it again. You refuse. I like wildcats and I like Christians, but I don't like Christian wildcats. Now I'm close hauled. Trot out your tornado. Let the tiger loose. It's the tamer, the man in the cage, that has to look lively and use the red-hot crowbar. But by Jove, I'm out of the cage. I'm a mere spectator of the married circus. Be a game sport, then. Our marriage was a wager. You wagered you could live with me. You lost, you paid with a divorce, and now is the time to show your sporting blood. Come on, shake hands and part friends. Not in this world. Friends with you? No. I have a proper pride. I don't propose to put my pride in my pocket. Oh, I wouldn't ask you to put your pride in your pocket while Vida's handkerchief is there. Pretty little bijou of a handkerchief. Pulling out the handkerchief. 
and she is charming and divorced and reasonably well made up. Oh, well, Vito is a woman. Toying with a handkerchief. I'm a man, a handkerchief is a handkerchief, and as some old Aristotle or other said, whatever concerns a woman concerns me. Insufferable. Well, yes, you're perfectly right. There's no possible harmony between divorced people. I withdraw my hand and all good feeling. No wonder I couldn't stand you, eh? However, that's pleasantly past. But at least, my dear Carslake, let us have some sort of beauty behavior. If we cannot be decent, let us endeavor to be graceful. If we can't be moral, at least we can avoid being vulgar. Well... If there's to be no more marriage in the world... Oh, but that's not it. There's to be more and more and more! Very well. I repeat, then, if there's to be nothing but marriage and divorce and remarriage and re-divorce, at least, at least those who are divorced can avoid the vulgarity of meeting each other here, there, and everywhere. Oh, that's where you come out! I thought so yesterday, and today I know it. It's an insufferable thing to a woman of any delicacy of feeling to find her husband. Ahem! <coughs> Former! Once a husband, always. Oh, no! Oh, dear, no! To find her, to find the man she has once lived with in the house of, making love to, to find you here. You smile, but I say it should be a social axiom no woman should have to meet her former husband. Oh, I don't know. After I've served my term, I don't mind meeting my jailer. It's indecent. At the horse show, the opera, at races and balls, to meet the man who wants... It's not civilized. It's fantastic. It's half-baked. Oh, I never should have come here. But it's entirely your fault. My fault? Of course. What business have you to be about? To be at large? To be at all? Gosh! To be where I am. Yes, it's just as horrible for you to turn up in my life as it would be for a dead person to insist on coming back to life and dinner and bridge. Horrid idea. Yes, but it's you who behave just as if you were not dead, just as if I'd not spent a fortune on your funeral. You do. You prepare to bob up at afternoon teas and dinners and embarrass me to death with your extinct personality. Well, of course we were married, but it didn't quite kill me. You killed yourself for me. I divorced you. I buried you out of my life. If any human soul was ever dead, you are, and there's nothing I so hate as a gibbering ghost. Oh, I say! Go gibber and squeak where gibbering and squeaking are the fashion. And so, my dear child, I'm to abate myself as a nuisance. Well, as far as seeing you is concerned, for my part, it's just like seeing a horse who's chucked you once. The bruises are okay, and you see him with a sort of easy curiosity. Of course, you know he'll jolly well chuck the next man. Permit me. John picks up her gloves, handkerchief, and parasol, and gives her these as she drops them one by one in her agitation. There's pleasure in the thought. Oh. And now, may I ask you a very simple question? Mere curiosity on my part, but why did you come here this morning? I have already explained that to you. Not your real motive. Permit me. Oh. But I believe I've guessed your real... Permit me. Your real motive. Oh. Cynthia... I am sorry for you. Hmm? Of course, we had a pretty lively case of the fever, the mutual attraction fever, and we were married a very short time. And I conclude that's what's the matter with you. You see, my dear, seven months of married life is too short a time to cure a bad case of the fancies. What? That's my diagnosis. I don't think I understand. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. What do you mean? Would you mind not breaking my crop? Thank you. I mean that ours was a case of premature divorce, and <clears throat> you're in love with me still. He pauses. Cynthia has one moment of fury. Then she realizes at what a disadvantage this places her. She makes an immense effort, recovers her calm, thinks hard for a moment more, and then has suddenly an inspiration. Jack, some day you'll get the blind staggers from conceit. No, I'm not in love with you, Mr. Carslake, but I shouldn't be at all surprised if she were. She's just your sort, you know. She's a man-eating shark, and you'll be a toothsome mouthful. Oh, come now, Jack, what a silly you are. Oh, yes, you are to get off a joke like that. Me, in love with— She looks at him. Why are you here? Why are you here? Guess. Why are you— Why am I here? I'll tell you. I'm going to be married— I had a longing, an irresistible longing to see you make an ass of yourself just once more. It happened. I know better. But I came for a serious purpose, too. 
I came, my dear fellow, to make an experiment on myself. I've been with you thirty minutes, and— She sighs with content. It's all right. What's all right? I'm immune. Immune? You're not catching any more. Yes, you see, I said to myself, if I fly into a temper— You did! If I fly into a temper when I see him, well, that shows I'm not yet so entirely convalescent that I can afford to have Jack Carsleg at my house. If I remain calm, I shall ask him to dinner. Ask me if you dare. He rises. Ask you to dinner? Oh, my dear fellow, I'm going to do much more than that. We must be friends, old man. We must meet. We must meet often. We must show New York the way the thing should be done, and, to show you I mean it, I want you to be my best man and give me away when I'm married this afternoon. You don't mean that! He pushes back his chair. There you are, always suspicious. You don't mean that! Don't I? I ask you come, and come as you are, and I'll lay my wedding gown to Cynthia Kay that you won't be there. If you're there, you get the gown, and if you're not, I get Cynthia Kay. I take it! Done. Now then, we'll see which of us two is the real sporting goods. Shake. They shake hands on it. Would you mind letting me have a plain soda? John goes to the table, and, as he is rattled and does not regard what he is about, he fills the glass three-fourths full with whiskey. He gives this to Cynthia, who looks him in the eye with an air of triumph. Thanks. Maliciously, as Vida enters. Your hand is a bit shaky. I think you need a little King William. John shrugs his shoulders, and, as Vida immediately speaks, Cynthia defers drinking. Vida to Cynthia. My dear, I'm sorry to tell you your husband— I mean, my husband. I mean, Philip. He's asking for you over the phone. You must have said you were coming here. Of course, I told him you were not here and hung up. Benson entering hurriedly and at once moving to Vida. Ma'am, the new footman's been talking with Mr. Fillimore on the wire. He told Mr. Fillimore that his lady was here. And, if I can believe my ears, ma'am, he's got Sir Wilfred on the phone now. Sir Wilfred making his appearance, perplexed and annoyed. I say, you know, extraordinary country. That old chap Fillimore, he's been damned impertinent over the wire. Says I've run off with Mrs. Carslake. Talks about Louise. Now who the deuce is Louise? He's coming round here too. I said Mrs. Carslake wasn't here. Seeing Cynthia. Hello. Good job. What a liar I am. Benson coming to the door to Vida. Mr. Fiddler, ma'am, says the mare is getting very restive. John hears this and moves at once. Benson withdraws. John to Vida. If that mare's restive, she'll break out in a rash. Vida to John. Will you take me? Of course. They go to the door. Cynthia to John. Ta-ta, old man. Meet you at the altar. If I don't, the mare's mine. Sir Wilfrid looks at her amazed. Vida to Cynthia. Do the honors, dear, in my absence. Come along, come along. Never mind them. A horse is a horse. John and Vida go out gaily and in haste. At the same moment, Cynthia drinks what she supposes to be her glass of plain soda. As it is whiskey straight, she is seized with astonishment and a fit of coughing. Sir Wilfrid relieves her of the glass. Sir Wilfrid indicating the contents of the glass. I say, do you ordinarily take it as high up as seven fingers and two thumbs? <coughs> Jack poured it out. Just shows how groggy he was. And now, Sir Wilfrid. She gets her things to go. Oh, you can't go. Brooks appears at the door. I am to be married at three. Let him wait. Aside to Brooks, whom he meets near the door. If Mr. Fillmore comes, bring his card up. Brooks going. Yes, Sir Wilfred. To me. Tipping him. Brooks bowing. To you, Sir Wilfred. Brooks goes. Sir Wilfred returning to Cynthia. I've got to have my innings, you know. I say, you've been crying. King William. You are crying. Poor little girl. I feel all shaken and cold. Brooks returns with a card. Poor little girl. I didn't sleep a wink last night. Oh, what is the matter with me? Why, it's plain as a pugstaff, you. Brooks is carried in the card to Sir Wilfred, who picks it up and says aside to Brooks. Fillimore? Brooks assents, aloud to Cynthia, calmly deceitful. Who's Wardolf Smith? Cynthia shakes her head. To Brooks, returning card to Salver. Tell the gentleman Mrs. Carslake is not here. Brooks leaves the room. I thought it was Philip. So did I. And now, Mrs. Carslake, I'll tell you why you're crying. Sitting down beside her. 
You're marrying the wrong man. I'm sorry for you, but you're such a goose. Here you are marrying this legal luminary. What for? You don't know. He don't know. But I do. You pretend you're marrying him because it's the sensible thing. Not a bit of it. You're marrying Mr. Fillimore because of all the other men you ever saw he's the least like Jack Carslake. That's a very good reason. There's only one good reason for marrying, and that is because you'll die if you don't. Oh, I've tried that. The scripture says, try, try again. I tell you, there's nothing like a whim. What's that? Whim? Oh, you mean a whim. Do please try and say whim. Whim? You must have a whim. Whim for the chap you marry. I had for Jack. Your whim wasn't whimmy enough, my dear. If you'd had more of it, and tougher, it would have stood, you know. Now, I'm not proposing. I hope not. Oh, I will later. It's not time yet. As I was saying. And pray, Sir Wilfrid, when will it be time? As soon as I see you have a whim for me. And now, I'll tell you what we'll do. We've got just an hour to get there in. My motor's in the corner. In fifty minutes, we'll be at Belmont Park. Belmont Park? We'll do the races and dine at Martin's. Oh, if I only could. I can't. I've got to be married. You're awfully nice. I've almost got a whim for you already. There you are. I'll send a telegram. She shakes her head. He sits and writes at the table. No, no, no. Sir Wilfrid, reading what he has written. Off with Kate Darby to races. Please postpone ceremony till 7.30. Oh, no, it's impossible. No more than breathing. You can't get a whim for me, you know, unless we're together. So together we'll be. John Carslake opens the door and, unnoticed, walks into the room. And tomorrow you wake up with a jolly little whim. Reading. Postpone ceremony till 7.30. There. He puts on her cloak and, turning, sees John. Hello. Hello. Sorry to disturb you. Just the man. Giving him the telegraph form. Just step round and send it, my boy. Thanks. John reads it. No, no, I can't go. Cookity cuckoo can't, I say you must. No. Do you mean you're going? Off to the races, my boy. Mrs. Carslake can't go with you there. Cynthia starts, amazed at his assumption of marital authority, and delighted that she will have an opportunity of outraging his sensibilities. Oh. Uh -huh. An hour before her wedding? May I know if it's the custom? It's worse than eloping. Custom, you know, for the husband that was to dictate. By George, there's a limit. What? 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 Gathering up her things. What did I hear you say? Ah, I say there's a limit. Oh, there's a limit, is there? There is. I bar the way. It means reputation. It means... We shall see what it means. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm here to protect your reputation. We've got to make haste, you know. Now I'm ready. Be sensible. You're breaking off the match. What's that to you? It's boots and saddles. John taking his stand between them and the door. No thoroughfare. Look here, my boy. Wait a moment, Sir Wilfred. Give me the wire. Thanks. Taking the telegraph form from him and tearing it up. There. Too rude to chuck in by wire. But you, Jack, you've taken on yourself to look after my interests. So I'll just ask you, old man, to run down to the Supreme Court and tell Philip, nicely you know, I'm off with Sir Wilfred and where. Say I'll be back by seven if I'm not later. And make it clear, Jack, I'll marry him by 8.30 or 9 at the latest. And mind you're there, dear. And now, Sir Wilfred, we're off. I, I'm not the man to, to carry... Oh, yes, you are. A message from you? Oh, yes, you are. You're just exactly the man. Cynthia and Sir Wilfred whirl out. Great miracles of Moses! End of Act Two. Act Three of The New York Idea by Langdon Mitchell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three. Scene. The same as that of Act One, but the room has been cleared of superfluous furniture and arranged for a wedding ceremony. Mrs. Fillmore is reclining on the sofa at the right of the table, Miss Hennage at its left. Sudley is seated at the right of the table. Grace is seated on the sofa. 
There is a wedding bell of roses, an arch of orange blossoms, and, girdled by a ribbon of white, an altar of calla lilies. There are cushions of flowers, alcoves of flowers, vases of flowers, in short, flowers everywhere, and in profusion and variety. Before the altar are two cushions for the couple to kneel on, and, on pedestals, at each side of the arch are twin candelabra. The hangings are pink and white. The room, first of all, and its emblems, holds the undivided attention, then slowly engaging it, and in contrast to their gay surroundings, the occupants. About each and every one of them hangs a deadly atmosphere of suppressed irritation. All very well, my dear Sarah. But you see the hour. Twenty to ten. We have been here since half past two. You had dinner? I didn't come here at two to have dinner at eight, and we kept waiting until ten. And, my dear Sarah, when I asked where the bride is... I have told you all I know. Mr. John Carslake came to the house at lunchtime, spoke to Philip, and they left the house together. Where is Philip? I don't wish to be censorious or to express an actual opinion, but I must say it's a bold bride who keeps her future mother-in-law waiting for eight hours. However... I will not venture to— I do. I'm sorry I went to the expense of a silver ice pitcher. Mrs. Fillimore sighs. Miss Hennage keeps her temper with an effort which is obvious. Thomas opens the door. For my part, I don't believe Mrs. Carslake means to return here or to marry Philip at all. Thomas coming in and approaching Miss Hennage. Two telegrams for you, ma'am. The choir boys have had their supper. A slight movement ripples the ominous calm of all. Thomas steps back. At last we shall know. From the lady, probably. Miss Hennage opens the first telegram and reads it at a glance, laying it on the salver again with a look at Sudley. Thomas passes the salver to Sudley, who takes the telegram. There's a toot now. I don't wish to intrude, but really I cannot imagine Philip marrying at midnight. As Sudley reads, Miss Hennage opens the second telegram, but does not read it. Sudley reading. Accident. Autostruck. Something. Gasoline. That's something. Elizabeth. Eh? Home by 9.45. Hold the church. A general movement sets in. Hold the church? William. She still means to marry Philip. And tonight, too. It's from Belmont Park. She went to the races. This is from Philip. Reading the second telegram. I arrive at ten o'clock. Have dinner ready. Miss Hennage motions to Thomas, who, obeying, retires, looking at her watch. They are both due now. What's to be done? She rises and suddenly shrugs his shoulders. After a young woman has spent her wedding day at the races. Why, I consider that she has broken the engagement. And when she comes, tell her so. I'll telephone Matthew. The choir boys can go home. Her maid can pack her belongings. And when the lady arrives... Impudently, the very distant toot of an auto-horn breaks in upon her words, producing, in proportion to its growing nearness, an increasing pitch of excitement and indignation. Grace flies to the door and looks out. Mrs. Fillimore, helpless, does not know what to do or where to go or what to say. Sudley moves about excitedly. Miss Hennage stands ready to make herself disagreeable. I hear a man's voice. Kate Darby and brother met you. A loud and brazenly insistent toot outrages afresh. Laughter and voices outside are heard faintly. Grace looks out of the door and as quickly withdraws. Outrageous. Disgraceful. Shocking. I shall not take any part at all in the, uh... Don't trouble yourself. Through the growing noise of voices and laughter, Cynthia's voice is heard. Sir Wilfrid is seen in the outer hall. He is burdened with wraps, not to mention a newspaper and parasol, which in no wise check his flow of gay remarks to Cynthia, who is still outside. Cynthia's voice, and now Matthew's, reach those inside, and, at last, both join Sir Wilfrid, who has turned at the door to wait for them. As she reaches the door, Cynthia turns and speaks to Matthew, who immediately follows her. She is in automobile attire, wearing goggles, a veil, and an exquisite duster of latest Paris style. They come in with a subdued bustle and noise. 
As their eyes light on Cynthia, Sudley and Miss Hennage exclaim, and there is a general movement. Upon my word. Ha! Huh. Shocking! Grace remains standing above sofa. Sudley moves toward her, Miss Hennage sitting down again. Mrs. Fillmore reclines on sofa. Cynthia begins to speak as soon as she appears, and speaks fluently to the end. No! I never was so surprised in my life as when I strolled into the paddock and they gave me a rousing reception. Old Jimmy Withers, Det Gollop, Jack Deal, Monty Spiffles, the Governor, and Buckeye, all of my old admirers. They simply fell on my neck, and, dear Matthew, what do you think I did? I turned on the water main. There are movements and murmurs of disapprobation from the family. Matthew indicates a desire to go. Oh, but you can't go. I'll return it in no time. I'm all ready to be married. Are they ready? Matthew waves a pious, polite gesture of recognition to the family. I beg everybody's pardon. Taking off her wrap and putting it on the back of a chair. My goggles are so dusty I can't see who's who. To Sir Wilfrid. Thanks. You have carried it well. She takes the parasol from Sir Wilfrid. When may I? See you next, Goodwood. Oh, I'm coming back. Not a bit of use in coming back. I shall be married before you get here. Ta-ta, Goodwood. I'm coming back. Cynthia, beginning to take off her goggles and moving nearer the family. I do awfully apologize for being so late. Mrs. Carslake. Ahem. Cynthia lays down goggles and sees their severity. Dear me. Surveying the flowers and for a moment speechless. Oh, good heavens! Why, it looks like a smart funeral. After what has occurred, Mrs. Carslake? Cynthia glances quietly toward the table and then sits down at it, composed and good-tempered. I see you got my wire, so you know where I have been. To the race course! With a roddy Englishman. We concluded you desired to break the engagement. No, no, oh, no! Do you intend, despite of our opinion of you, the only opinion that would have any weight with me would be Mrs. Phillimore's. She turns expectantly to Mrs. Phillimore. I am generally asleep at this hour, and accordingly I will not venture to express any, uh, any actual opinion. You smile. We simply inform you that as regards to us, the alliance is not grateful. And all this because the gasoline gave out. My patience has given out. So has mine. I'm going. She makes good her word. My dear young lady, you come here to the sacred uh, uh, spa, altar, artifice of the paddock, speaking of spiffles and buckeye, having practically eloped, having created a scandal, and disgraced our family. How does it disgrace you? Because I like to see a high-bred, clean, nervy, sweet little four-legged gee play the antelope over a hurdle. Sister. It is high time that you— She turns to Cynthia with a gesture. Mrs. Phillimore is generally asleep at this hour, and accordingly she will not venture to express— Enough, madam. I venture to, 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 to say you are leading a fast life. Not in this house. For six heavy weeks have I been laid away in the grave, and I've found it very slow indeed trying to keep pace with the dead. This comes of horses. Of what? C caring for horses. What Mrs. Carslake cares for is men. What would you have me care for? The Ornithorhynchus Paradoxus? Or Pithecanthropus Erectus? Oh, I refuse to take you seriously. Sudley begins to prepare to leave. He buttons himself into respectability and his coat. My dear madam, I take myself seriously. And madam, I, I retract what I have brought with me. As a graceful gift, an Egyptian scarab. A, a sacred beetle, which once ornamented the person of a, a mummy. It should never be absent from your pocket, Mr. Sudley. Sudley walks away in a rage. I have a vast mind to withdraw my... Your wedding present, the little bronze cat. Oh. Even Mrs. Fillmore comes momentarily to life and expresses silent indignation. Sarah, I'm going. Grace, who has met Philip, takes occasion to accompany him into the room. Philip looks dusty and grim. As they come in, Grace speaks to him, and Philip shakes his head. They pause near the door. I shall go to my room. However, all I ask is that you repeat to Philip. 
As she moves toward the door, she comes suddenly upon Philip and speaks to him in a low voice. As I go out, I shall do myself the pleasure of calling a hansom for Mrs. Carslake. Philip moves slightly from the door. As you go out, Sudley, have a hansom called, and when it comes, get into it. Ah, uh -uh, my dear sir, I'll leave you to your fate. Philip angrily points him the door, and Sudley leaves in great haste. Philip, you've not heard. Everything, from Grace. My sister has repeated your words to me, and her own. I've told her what I think of her. Philip looks witheringly at Grace. I shan't wait to hear any more. She flounces out of the room. Don't make it necessary for me to tell you what I think of you. Philip moves to the right, toward his mother, to whom he gives his arm. Miss Hennage immediately seeks the opposite side. Mother, with your permission, I desire to be alone. I expect both you and Grace, Sarah, to be dressed and ready for the ceremony a half-hour from now. I shall come or not as I see fit. And let me add, my dear brother, that a fool at forty is a fool indeed. Miss Hennage, high and mighty, goes out, much pleased with her quotation. My dear son, I won't venture to express— No, mother, don't. But I shall expect you, of course, at the ceremony. Mrs. Fillmore languidly retires. Philip strides to the center of the room, taking the tone and assuming the attitude of the injured husband. It is proper for me to tell you that I followed you to Belmont. I am aware. I know with whom. In fact, I know all. And now, let me assure you, I am the last man in the world to be jilted on the very eve of, of, everything with you. I won't be jilted. Cynthia is silent. You understand? I propose to marry you. I won't be made ridiculous. Philip, I didn't mean to make you— Why, then, did you run off to Belmont Park with that fellow? Philip, I— uh... What motive? What reason? On our wedding day! Why did you do it? I'll tell you the truth. I was bored. Bored? In my company? I was bored, and then— Besides, Sir Wilfrid asked me to go. Exactly. And that was why you went. Cynthia, when you promised to marry me— you told me you had forever done with love. You agreed that marriage was the rational coming together of two people. I know, I know. Do you believe that now? I don't know what I believe. My brain is in a whirl. But, Philip, I am beginning to be. I'm afraid, yes, I am afraid that one can't just select a great and good man and say I will be happy with him. I don't see why not. You must assuredly do one or the other— you must either let your heart choose or your head select. No, there is a third scheme. Sir Wilfrid explained the theory to me. A woman should marry whenever she has a whim for the man and then leave the rest to the man. Do you see? Do I see? Have I ever seen anything else? Marry for whim. That's the New York idea of marriage. New York ought to know. Marry for whim and leave the rest to the divorce court. Marry for whim and leave the rest to the man. That was the former Mrs. Fillimore's idea, only she spelled whim differently. She omitted the W. And now, you, you take up with this preposterous, but nonsense. It's impossible. A woman of your mental caliber, no. Some obscure, primitive female feeling is at work, corrupting your better judgment. What is it you feel? Philip, you never felt like a fool, did you? No, never. I thought not. No, but whatever your feelings, I conclude you are ready to marry me. Of course I came back. I am here, am I not? You are ready to marry me? But you haven't had your dinner. Do I understand you refuse? Couldn't we defer? You refuse? No, I said I'd marry you. I'm a woman of my word. I will. Ah, very good then. Run to your room. Cynthia turns to Philip. Throw something over you. In a half hour I'll expect you here. And Cynthia, my dear, remember, I cannot cuculate like a wood pigeon, but I esteem you. I think I'll go, Philip. I may not be fitted to play the love bird, but— I think I'll go, Philip. I'll expect you in half an hour. Yes. And Cynthia, 
Don't think any more about that fellow, Kate Darby. No. As Cynthia leaves, Thomas comes in from the opposite door. Philip, not seeing Thomas, and clumsily defiant. And if I had that fellow, Kate Darby, in the dock— Sir Wilfred Kate Darby. Sir what? What? Who? Sir Wilfred enters in evening dress. Philip looks Sir Wilfred in the face and speaks to Thomas. Tell Sir Wilfred Cates Darby I am not at home to him. Thomas is embarrassed. My dear Lord Eldon. Philip again addressing Thomas. Show the gentleman the door. There is a pause. Sir Wilfred, with a significant gesture, glances at the door. Sir Wilfred, moving to the door, he examines it and returns to Philip. Eh? I admire the door, my boy. Fine old carved mahogany panel, but don't ask me to leave by it. For Mrs. Carslake made me promise I'd come. And that's why I'm here. Thomas does not wait for further orders. Sir, you are impudent. Ah, you put it all in a nutshell, don't you? To show your face here, after practically eloping with my wife. When were you married? We are as good as married. Oh, Poo-Poo, you can't tell me that grace before soup is as good as a dinner. Sir, I demand... Mrs. Carslake is not married. That's why I'm here. I'm here for the same purpose you are, to ask Mrs. Carslake to be my wife. Are you in your senses? Come, come, Judge. You Americans have no sense of humor. Taking a small jewel case from his pocket. There's my regards for the lady, and... If I must go, I will. Of course, I would like to see her, but if it isn't your American custom... Thomas opens the door and announces, Mr. Carslake. Oh, well, I say. If he can come, I can. John Carslake, in evening dress, comes in quickly, carrying a large and very smart bride's bouquet, which he hands to Philip, who stands transfixed. Because it never occurs to him to refuse it or chuck it away, Philip accepts the bouquet gingerly, but frees himself of it at the first available moment. John walks to the center of the room. Deep down he is feeling wounded and unhappy. But as he knows his coming to the ceremony on whatever pretext is a social outrage, he carries it off by assuming an air of its being the most natural thing in the world. He controls the expression of his deeper emotion, but the pressure of this keeps his face grave, and he speaks with effort. My compliments to the bride, Judge. And you, too, have the effrontery? There you are. Oh, call it friendship. Thomas leaves. Philip puts bouquet on the table. I suppose Mrs. Carslake... She wagered me I wouldn't give her away, and of course... Throughout his stay, John hides the emotions he will not show behind a daring irony. Under its effects, Philip, on his right, walks about in a fury. Sir Wilfrid, sitting down on the edge of the table, is gay and undisturbed. You will oblige me, both of you, by immediately leaving. Oh, come, come, Judge. Suppose I am here. Who has a better right to attend his wife's obsequies? Certainly I come as a mourner. For you... I say, is it your custom? No, no, of course it's not the custom. No, but we'll make it the custom. After all, what's a divorced wife among friends? Sir, your humor is strained. Humor, Judge? It is, sir, and I'll not be bantered. Your both being here is... It is... Gentlemen, there is decorum which the stars in their courses do not violate. Now, Judge, never you mind what the stars do in their divorces. Get down to the earth of the present day. Rufus Choate and Daniel Webster are dead. You must be modern. You must let peroration and poetry alone. Come along now. Why shouldn't I give the lady away? Here, here. Uh, I beg your pardon. And why shouldn't we both be here? American marriage is a new thing. We've got to strike the pace. And the only trouble is, Judge, that the judiciary have so messed the thing up that a man can't be sure he is married until he's divorced. It's a sort of merry-go-round, to be sure. But let it go at that. Here we all are, and we're ready to marry my wife to you and start her on her way to him. Good Lord! You cannot trifle with monogamy. Now, now, Judge, monogamy is just as extinct as knee-britches. The new woman has a new idea, and the new idea is... 
Well, it's just the opposite of the old Mormon one. Their idea is one man, ten wives, and a hundred children. Our idea is one woman, a hundred husbands, and one child. Sir, this is polyandry. Polyandry? A hundred to one, it's polyandry, and that's it, Judge. Uncle Sam has established consecutive polyandry, but there's got to be an interval between husbands. The fact is, Judge, the modern American marriage is like a wire fence. The woman's the wire, the posts are the husbands. One, two, three, and if you cast your eye over the future, you can count them. Post after post, up hill, down dale, all the way to Dakota. All very amusing, sir, but the fact remains. Now, now, Judge, I like you. But you're asleep. You're living in the dark ages. You ought to call up Central. Hello, Central. Give me the present time. 1906, New York. Of course you do. And there you are. There I am not, sir. And... As for Mr. Carslake's ill-timed jocosity, sir, in the future... Oh, hang the future. I begin to hope, Sir Wilfrid, that in the future I shall have the pleasure of hanging you. To John. And as to you, sir, your insensate idea of giving away your own, your former, my, your... Oh, good Lord, this is a nightmare. He turns to go in despair. Matthew, coming in, meets him and stops him at the door. My dear brother, Aunt Sarah Heneage refuses to give Mrs. Carslake away unless you yourself, uh... Philip, as he goes out. No more. I'll attend to the matter. The choir boys are heard practicing in the next room. Matthew mopping his brow. How do you both do? My aunt has made me very warm. Ringing the bell. You hear our choir practicing. Sweet angel boys. Hmm. Hmm. Some of the family will not be present. I am very fond of you, Mr. Carslake, and I think it admirably Christian of you to have waived your, uh, your, uh, that is, now that I look at it more narrowly, let me say that in the excitement of pleasurable anticipation, I forgot, Carslake, that your presence might occasion remark. Thomas responds to his ring. Thomas, I left in the hall a small handbag or satchel containing my surplus. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. You must really find the handbag at once. Thomas turns to go when he stops, startled. Yes, sir. Announcing in consternation. This is Vida Fillimore. Vida Fillimore, in full evening dress, steps gently up to Matthew. Ah, my dear child, now this is just as it should be. That is, uh... He walks to the center of the room with her, Vida, the while pointedly disregarding Sir Wilfrid. That is, when I come to think of it, your presence might be deemed inauspicious. But, my dear Matthew, I had to come. Aside to him. I have a reason for being here. Thomas, who has left the room, again appears. But, my dear child... Sir, Mr. Fillimore wishes to have your assistance, sir, with Miss Hennage immediately. Ah! To Vida. One moment. I'll return. To Thomas. Have you found the bag with my surplus? He goes out with Thomas, speaking. Sir Wilfrid moves at once to Vida. John, moving to a better position, watches the door. Sir Wilfrid to Vida. You're just the person I most want to see. Oh, no, Sir Wilfrid. Cynthia isn't here yet. She moves to the table, and John, his eyes on the door, coming toward her, she speaks to him with obvious sweetness. Jack, dear, I never was so ravished to see anyone. By Jove! I knew I should find you here. Oh, now don't do that. Jack. Don't do it. Do what, Jack? Touch me with your voice. I have troubles enough of my own. And I know who your troubles are. Cynthia. From this moment, Vida abandons John as an object of the chase and works him into her other game. I hate her. I don't know why I came. You came, dear, because you couldn't stay away. You're in love with her. All right, Vida, what I feel may be love. But all I can say is, if I could get even with Cynthia Carslake... You can, dear. It's as easy as powdering one's face. 
All you have to do is be too nice to me. Eh? Don't you realize she's jealous of you? Why did she come to my house this morning? She's jealous, and all you have to do— If I can make her wince, I'll make love to you till the heavenly cows come home. Well, you see, my dear, if you make love to me, it will— Delicately indicating Sir Wilfrid. Cut both ways at once. Eh? What? Not Kate's Darby. Starting. Is that Cynthia? Now don't get rattled and forget to make love to me. I've got the jumps. Vida, I adore you. You must be more convincing. That won't do at all. Is that she now? Matthew comes in and passes to the inner room. It's Matthew. And Jack, dear, you'd best get the hang of it before Cynthia comes. You might tell me all about your divorce. That's a sympathetic subject. Were you able to undermine it? No. I've got a wire from my lawyer this morning. The divorce holds. She's a free woman. She can marry whom she likes. The organ is heard, very softly played. Is that Cynthia? He rises quickly. It's the organ. By George, I should never have come. I think I'll go. When I need you. I can't stand it. Oh, but Jack. Good night. I feel quite ill. Seeing that she must play her last card to keep him, pretends to faintness, sways, and falls into his arms. Oh! I believe you're putting up a fake! The organ swells as Cynthia enters sweepingly, dressed in full evening dress for the wedding ceremony. John, not knowing what to do, keeps his arms about Vida as a horrid necessity. Cynthia speaking as she comes in to Matthew. Here I am, ridiculous to make it a conventional thing, you know. Come in on the swell of the music and all that, just as if I'd never been married before. Where's Philip? She looks for Philip and sees John with Vida in his arms. She stops short. A glass of water. I, I beg your pardon, Mrs. Carslake. Vida. She has fainted. Fainted? Dear, 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 terrible, so she has. Sir Wilfrid takes the flowers from a vase and prepares to sprinkle Vida's forehead with the water it contains. No, no, not her forehead, Sir Wilfrid, her frock. Sprinkle her best pequin. If it's a real faint, she will not come to. Vida, coming quickly to her senses as her Paris importation is about to suffer. I almost fainted. Almost. Vida, using the stock phrase as a matter of course and reviving rapidly. Where am I? John glances at Cynthia sharply. Oh, the bride. I beg everyone's pardon. Cynthia, at a crisis like this, I simply couldn't stay away from Philip. Stay away from Philip? Your arm, Jack, and lead me where there is air. John and Vida go into the further room. The organ stops. Sir Wilfrid and Cynthia are practically alone in the room. John and Vida are barely within sight. He is first seen to take her fan and give her air, then to pick up a book and read to her. I've come back. Asks for air and goes to the greenhouse. Cynthia crosses the room and Sir Wilfrid offers her a seat. I know why you are here. It's that intoxicating little whim you suppose me to have for you. My regrets, but the whim's gone flat. Yes, yes, my gasoline days are over. I'm going to be garaged for good. However, I'm glad you're here. You take the edge off. Mr. Fillimore? No, Carslake. I'm just waiting to say the words. Thomas comes in unnoticed. Love, honor, and obey to Fillimore, and at Carslake. Seeing Thomas. What is it, Mr. Fillimore? Mr. Fillimore will be down in a few minutes, ma'am. He's very sorry, ma'am. Lowering his voice and coming nearer to Cynthia, mindful of the respectabilities. But there's a button off his waistcoat. Button off his waistcoat. Thomas goes out. Ah, so much the better for me. Cynthia looks into the other room. Now then, never mind those two. Sit down. I can't. You're as nervous as... Nervous? Of course I'm nervous. So would you be nervous if you'd had a runaway and smash up and you were going to try it again? She is unable to take her eyes from Vida and John, and Sir Wilfrid, noting this, grows uneasy. And if someone doesn't do away with those calla lilies, the odor makes me faint. No, it's not the lilies, it's the orange blossoms. Orange blossoms? 
the flowers that grow on the tree that hangs over the abyss. Sir Wilfrid promptly confiscates the vase of orange blossoms. They smell of six o'clock in the evening, when Philip's fallen asleep and little boys are crying the winners outside and I'm crying inside and dying inside and outside and everywhere. Sorry to disappoint you. They're artificial. That's it. They're emblematic of artificial domesticity. I'm here to help you bulk it. He sits down, and Cynthia half rises and looks toward John and Vida. Keep still now. I've a lot to say to you. Stop looking. Do you think I can listen to you make love to me when the man who... who... whom I most despise in all the world is reading poetry to the woman who... who got me into the fix I'm in? What do you want to look at them for? Let them be and listen to me. Sit down, for damn, I'm determined. I won't look at them. I won't think of them. Beasts. Sir Wilfrid interposes between her and her view of John. Thomas opens the door and walks in. Now then. Those two here. It's just as if Adam and Eve should invite the snake to their golden wedding. Seeing Thomas. What is it? What's the matter? Mr. Fillimore's excuses, ma'am, in a very short time. Thomas goes out. I'm on to you. You hoped for more buttons. I'm dying of the heat. Fan me. Sir Wilfrid fans Cynthia. Heat? No. You're dying because you're ignoring nature. Certainly you are. You're marrying Fillimore. Can't ignore nature, Mrs. Carslake. Yes, you are. You're forcing your feelings. And what you want to do is to let yourself go a bit. Up anchor and sit tight. I'm no seaman, but that's the idea. So just throw the reins on nature's neck, jump this fellow Fillimore, and marry me. You propose to me here at a moment like this, when I'm on the last lap just in sight of the goal, the gallows, the halter, the altar, I don't know what its name is. No, I won't have you. And I won't have you stand near me. I won't have you talking to me in a low tone. Stand over there. Stand where you are. I say. I can hear you. I'm listening. Well, don't look so hurried and worried. You've got buttons and buttons of time. And now my offer. You haven't yet said you would. Marry you? I don't even know you. Oh, tell you all about myself. I'm no duke in a pickle of debts, do you see? I can marry where I like. Some of my countrymen are rotters, you know. They'd marry a monkey if Pop-Up the Tree had a corner in coconuts. And they do marry some queer ones, you know. Cynthia looks beyond him, exclaims, and turns. Sir Wilfrid turns. Do they? Oh, rather. That's what's given your heiresses such a bad name lately. If a fellow's in debt, he can't pick and choose. And then he swears that American girls are awfully fine lookers, but they're no good when it comes to continuing the race. Fair dolls in the drawing room, but no good in the nursery. I can see Vida in the nursery. You understand when you want a broodmare, who don't choose a Kentucky mule. I think I see one. Well, that's what they're saying over there. They say your girls run to talk. And I have seen girls here that would chat life into a wooden Indian. That's what you Americans call being clever. All brains are no stuffing. In fact, some of your American girls are the nicest boys I've ever met. So that's what you think? Not a bit what I think. What my countrymen think. Why are you telling me? Oh, just explaining my character. I'm the sort that can pick and choose. And what I want is heart. No more heart than a dragonfly. The organ begins to play softly. That's it. Dragonfly. Cold as stone and never stops buzzing about and showing off her colors. It's that American dragonfly girl that I'm afraid of. Because, do you see, I don't know what an American expects when he marries. Yes. But you're not listening. I am listening, I am. An Englishman, you see, when he marries, expects three things. Love, obedience, and five children. Three things? I make it seven. Yes, my dear, but the point is, will you be mistress of Trainham? No, Sir Wilfrid, thank you, I won't. She turns to see John walk across the drawing room with Vida, and apparently absorbed in what she is saying. It's outrageous! Eh? Hey, why are you crying? I am not. You're not crying because you're in love with me. 
I'm not crying. Or if I am, I'm crying because I love my country. It's a disgrace to America. Cast off husbands and wives getting together in a parlor and playing tag under a palm tree. John, with intention and determined to stab Cynthia, kisses Vita's hand. Eh? Oh, I'm damned. What do you think that means? I don't doubt it means a wedding here, at once, after mine. Vita and John leave the drawing room and walk slowly toward them. Hush, Jack. I'd much rather no one should know anything about it until it's all over. Cynthia, starting and looking at Sir Wilfrid. What did I tell you? Vida to Cynthia. Oh, my dear, he's asked me to champagne and lobster at your house. His house. Matthew is coming. Cynthia starts, but controls herself. And you're to come, Sir Wilfrid. Intending to convey the idea of a sudden marriage ceremony. Of course, my dear, I would like to wait for your wedding, but something rather, rather important to me is to take place, and I know you'll excuse me. The organ stops. Oh, very neat, but you haven't given me a chance, even. Chance? You're not serious. I am. I'll give you a minute to offer yourself. Eh? Sixty seconds from now. There's such a thing as being silly. Fifty seconds left. I take you, count fair. I say, Mrs. Carslake. They're engaged. They're going to be married tonight over champagne and lobster at my house. Will you consider your... No, 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 no. Thank you, Sir Wilfred. I will not. Thanks awfully, Mrs. Fillimore. Too late. To Carslake. Jack, dear, we must be off. I say... Is it your custom for American girls that sixty seconds or too late? Look here, not a bit too late. I'll take you around to Jack Carslake's, and I'm going to ask the same old question again, you know. But I, Jove, you know in your country it's the pace that kills. Sir Wilfred follows Vida out the door. Good night, Mrs. Carslake. I'm going. I'm sorry I came. Sorry? Why are you sorry? You've got what you wanted. I wouldn't mind your marrying Vida. Oh, wouldn't you? But I don't think you showed good taste in engaging yourselves here. Of course, I should have preferred a garden of roses and plenty of twilight. I'll tell you what you have done. You've thrown yourself away. A woman like that, no head, no heart. All languor and loose, loose frocks. She's the typical worst thing America can do. She's the regular American marriage worm. I have known others. Not me. I'm not a patch on that woman. Do you know anything about her life? Do you know the things she did to Philip? Kept him up every night of his life, forty days out of every thirty, and then, without his knowing it, put brandy in his coffee to make him lively at breakfast. I begin to think she is just the woman. She is not the woman for you. A man with your bad temper, your airs of authority, your assumption of... of everything. What you need is a good, old-fashioned, bread-poultice woman. Cynthia comes to a full stop and faces him. Can't I have had any experience of the good old-fashioned bread poultice? I don't care what you say. If you marry Vita Fillimore, you shan't do it. No, I liked your father, and for his sake I'll see that his son doesn't make a donkey of himself a second time. Oh, I thought I was divorced. I begin to feel as if I had you on my hands still. You have. You shall have. If you attempt to marry her, I'll follow you. And I'll find her. I'll tell Vita. I will. I'll tell Vita just what sort of a dance you led me. Indeed? Will you? And why do you care what happens to me? I... I... Uh... Why do you care? I don't. Not in your sense. How dare you, then, pretend? I don't pretend. How dare you look me in the face with the eyes that I once kissed and pretend the least regard for me? Cynthia recoils and looks away. Her own feelings are revealed to her clearly for the first time. I begin to understand our American women now. Fireflies! And the fire they gleam with is so cold that a midge couldn't warm his heart at it, let alone a man. You're not of the same race as a man. You married me for nothing, divorced me for nothing, because you are nothing. Jack, what are you saying? What, you feigning an interest in me, feigning a lie, and in five minutes? With a gesture indicating the altar. Oh, you've taught me the trick of your sex. 
You're the woman who is not a woman. You're saying terrible things to me. You haven't been divorced from me long enough to forget what you should be ashamed to remember. I don't know what you mean. You're not able to forget me. You know you're not able to forget me. Ask yourself if you're able to forget me. And when your heart, such as it is, answers no, then... The organ is plainly heard. Well then, prance gaily up to the altar and <laughs> marry that, if you can. He abruptly quits the room, and Cynthia, moving to an armchair, sinks into it, trembling. Matthew comes in and is joined by Miss Hennage and Philip. They do not see Cynthia buried deeply in her chair. Accordingly, Miss Hennage moves over to the sofa and waits. They are all dressed for an evening reception, and Philip is in the traditional bridegroom's rig. I am sure you will do your part, Sarah, in a spirit of Christian decorum. It was impossible to find my surplice, Philip. But the more informal, the better. Where's Cynthia? Matthew gives a glance around the room. Ah, here's the choir. He moves forward to meet it. Choir boys come in very orderly, divide and take their places, and even number on each side of the altar of flowers. Matthew vaguely superintends. Philip gets in the way of the bell and moves out of the way. Thomas comes in. Thomas, I directed you. One moment, if you please. He indicates the tables and chairs, which Thomas hastens to push against the wall. Where's Cynthia? Cynthia rises, and, at the movement, Philip sees her and moves toward her. The organ grows suddenly silent. Here I am. Matthew comes down. Organ plays softly. Ah, my very dear Cynthia, I knew there was something. Let me tell you the words of the hymn I have chosen. Enduring love, sweet end of strife. Oh, bless this happy man and wife. I'm afraid you feel, eh, uh, uh... I feel awfully queer. I think I need a scotch. Organ stops. Philip remains uneasily at a little distance. Mrs. Fillimore and Grace enter back slowly, as cheerfully as if they were going to hear the funeral service read. They remain near the doorway. Really, my dear, in the pomp and vanity... I mean, ceremony of this, this unique occasion, there should be sufficient exhilaration. But there isn't. Feeling weak, she sits down. I don't think my bishop would approve of, uh, anything before. I feel very queer. My dear child. However, I suppose there's nothing for it now but to... to... Courage. Oh, don't speak to me. I feel as if I'd been eating gunpowder and the very first word of the wedding service would set it off. My dear, your indisposition is the voice of nature. Ah, that's it. Nature. Matthew shakes his head. I've a great mind to throw the reins on nature's neck. Matthew. He moves to take his stand for the ceremony. Matthew looks at Philip. To Cynthia. Philip is ready. Philip comes forward, and the organ plays the wedding march. Ready. 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 Cynthia, you will take Miss Henniage's arm. Miss Henniage moves stiffly nearer to the table. Sarah. He waves Miss Henniage in the direction of Cynthia, at which she advances a joyless step or two. Matthew goes over to give the choir a low direction. Now, please don't forget, my boys. When I raise my hand so, you begin, Enduring love, sweet end of strife, etc. Cynthia has risen. On the table by which she stands is her long lace cloak. Matthew assumes sacerdotal importance and takes his position inside the altar of flowers. Ahem. <clears throat> Philip! He signs to Philip to take his position. Sarah! Cynthia breathes fast and supports herself against the table. Miss Hennage, with the silent air of a martyr, goes toward her and stands for a moment looking at her. The ceremony will now begin. The organ plays Mendelssohn's Wedding March. Cynthia turns and faces Miss Hennage. Miss Hennage slowly reaches Cynthia and extends her hand in her readiness to lead the bride to the altar. Mrs. Carslake. Ahem. Matthew walks forward two or three steps. Cynthia stands as if turned to stone. My dear Cynthia, I request you to take your place. Cynthia moves one or two steps as if to go up to the altar. 
She takes Miss Hennage's hand, and slowly they walk toward Matthew. Your husband-to-be is ready. The ring is in my pocket. I have only to ask you the, uh, necessary questions, and, uh, all will be blissfully over in a moment. The organ grows louder. Cynthia, at this moment, just as she reaches Philip, stops, faces round, looks him, Matthew, and the rest in the face, and cries out in despair. Thomas, call a hansom. Thomas goes out, leaving the door open. Miss Hennage crosses the room quickly. Mrs. Fillimore, shocked into action, rises. Cynthia catches up her cloak from the table. Philip turns, and Cynthia comes forward and stops. I can't. Philip, I can't. Whistle of handsome is heard off. The organ stops. It is simply a case of throwing the reins on nature's neck. Up anchor and sit tight. Matthew moves to Cynthia. Matthew, don't come near me. Yes, yes, I distrust you. It's your business, and you'd marry me if you could. Philip, watching her in dismay as she throws on her cloak. Where are you going? I'm going to Jack. What for? To stop his marrying Vida. I'm blowing a hurricane inside, a horrible, happy hurricane. I know myself. I know what's the matter with me. If I married you and Miss Hennage, what's the use of talking about it? He mustn't marry that woman. He shan't. Cynthia has now all her wraps on and walks toward the door rapidly. To Philip. Sorry. So long. Good night, and see you later. Reaching the door, she goes out in blind haste and without further ceremony. Matthew, in absolute amazement, throws up his arms. Philip is rigid. Mrs. Fillimore sinks into a chair. Miss Hennage stands supercilious and unmoved. Grace the same. The choir, at Matthew's gesture, mistakes it for the concerted signal, and bursts lustily into the epithalamus. Enduring love, sweet end of strife, O oh, bless this happy man and wife. End of Act Three Act Four of the New York Idea by Langdon Mitchell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Four Scene The scene is laid in John Carslake's study and smoking room. There is a bay window on the left. A door on the left leads to stairs and the front of the house, while a door at the back leads to the dining room. A fireplace and a mantel are on the right. A bookcase contains law and sporting books. On the wall is a full-length portrait of Cynthia. Nothing of this portrait is seen by audience except the gilt frame and a space of canvas. A large table with writing materials is littered over with law books, sporting books, papers, pipes, crops, a pair of spurs, etc. A wedding ring lies on it. There are three very low easy chairs. The general appearance of the room is extremely gay and garish in color. It has the easy confusion of a man's room. There is a small table on which, lying open, is a woman's sewing basket, and beside it a piece of rich fancy work, as if a lady had just risen from sewing. Laid on the further end of it are a lady's gloves. On a chair back is a lady's hat. It is half an hour later than the close of Act Three. Curtains are drawn over the window. A lamp on the table is lighted, as are, too, the various electric lights. One chair is conspicuously standing on its head. Nogam is busy at the larger table. The door into the dining-room is half open. Sir Wilfred, coming in from the dining-room. Eh? Hey, what did you say your name was? Nogam, sir. Nogam? I've been here thirty minutes. Where are the cigars? Nogam motions to a small table near the entrance door. Thank you, Nogam. Mr. Carslake was to have followed us here immediately. He lights a cigar. Mr. Carslake just now phoned from his club, and he's on his way home, sir. Nogam, why is that chair upside down? Our orders, sir. Vida speaking as she comes in. Oh, Wilfred! Sir Wilfred turns. Vida coming slowly toward him. I can't be left longer alone with the lobster. He reminds me too much of Fillimore. Carslake's come in, stopped at his club on the way. To Nogam. 
You haven't heard anything of Mrs. Carslake? No, sir. Sir Wilfrid, in an aside to Vita, as they move right, to appear to be out of Nogam's hearing. Deucedly odd, you know, for the Reverend Matthew declared it. She'd left Fillimore's house before he did, and she told them she was coming here. Nogum evidently takes this in. Oh, she'll turn up. Yes, but I don't see how the Reverend Fillimore had the time to get here and make us man and wife, don't you know? Oh, Matthew had a fast horse and Cynthia a slow one. Or she's a woman and changed her mind. Perhaps she's gone back and married Fillimore. And besides, dear, Matthew wasn't in the house four minutes and a half, only just long enough to hoop the hoop. She twirls her new wedding ring gently about her finger. Wasn't it lucky he had a ring in his pocket? Oh, rather. And are you aware, dear, that Fillimore bought and intended it for Cynthia? Do come. Going toward the door through which she has just entered. I'm desperately hungry. Whenever I'm married, that's the effect it has. Vita goes out, and Sir Wilfrid, following, stops to talk to Nogum. We'll give Mr. Carslake ten minutes, Nogum. If he does not come, then, you might serve supper. He joins Vita. Yes, sir. The outside door opens, and Fiddler walks in. Hello, Nogum. Where's the governor? That mare's off her oats, and I've got to see him. He'll soon be here. It was the parson I met leaving the house. Sir Wilfrid and Mrs. Fillmore have a date with the governor in the dining room, and the reverend gentleman. He makes a gesture as of giving an ecclesiastical blessing. He hasn't spliced them. Nogum assents. He has. They're married. Never saw a parson could resist it. Yes, but I've got another piece of news for you. Who do you think the reverend Fillmore expected to find here? Mrs. Carslake. I saw her headed this way in a handsome with a bulky horse only a minute ago. If she hoped to be in at the finish. Fiddler is about to set the chair on its legs. Mr. Fiddler, sir, please to let it alone. Fiddler, putting the chair down in surprise. Does it live on its blooming head? Don't you remember? She threw it on its head when she left here, and he won't have it up. Ah, that's it. Hat, sewing basket, and all. The whole rig is to remain as it was when she handed him his knockout. A bell rings outside. There's the governor. I hear him. I'll serve the supper taking the letter from his pocket and putting it on the mantel. Mr. Fiddler, would you mind giving this to the governor? It's from his lawyer. His lawyer couldn't find him and left it with me. He said it was very important. The bell rings again, speaking from the door to Sir Wilfrid. I'm coming, sir. Nogum goes out, shutting the door. John Carslake comes in. His hat is pushed over his eyes. His hands are buried in his pockets, and his appearance generally is one of weariness and utter discouragement. He walks into the room slowly and heavily. He sees Fiddler, who salutes, forgetting the letter. John slowly sinks into the armchair near his study table. Hello, Fiddler. Came in to see you, sir, about Cynthia Kay. Damn Cynthia Kay. Couldn't have a word with you. No. Yes, sir. Fiddler? Yes, sir. Mrs. Carslake. Fiddler nods. Uh, you used to say she was our mascot? Yes, sir. Well, she's just married herself to a sort of a man. Sorry to hear it, sir. Well, Fiddler, between you and me, we're a pair of idiots. Yes, sir. And now it's too late. Yes, sir. I'll oh, beg your pardon, sir. Your lawyer left a letter. John takes the letter, opens it and reads it, indifferently at first. What's he got to say more than what his wire said? Eh? Dumbfounded as he reads. What? Will explain. Error in wording of telegram. Call me up. Turning quickly to the telephone. That can't mean that she's still... Hello? Hello? John listens. Would like to have a word with you, sir. Hello, Central. That mayor. John, consulting the letter and speaking into the phone. 332468A38. Did you get it? That mayor, sir. She's got a touch of malaria. Hello, Central. 332-46-A-38. Clayton Osgood. Yes. Yes, and say, Central, get a move on you. If you think well of it, sir, I'll give her a tonic. Hello? Yes? Yes? Jack Carslake. Is that you, Clayton? Yes? Yes? Well? Or if you like, sir, I'll give her... Shut up! To phone. What was that? 
Uh, not you, not you. A technical error. You mean to say that Mrs. Carslake is still my... Hold the wire, Central. Uh, get off the wire, get off the wire. Is that you, Clayton? Yes, yes, she and I are still... I got it. Goodbye. He hangs up the receiver, falls back into a chair. For a moment he is overcome. He takes up telephone book. All very well, Mr. Carslake, but I must know if I'm to give her... What's Fillimore's number? If you've no objections, I think I'll give her a... L-M-N-O-P! Oh, it's too late! She's married by this! Married! And, my God! I, I am the cause! Fillimore! I'll give her... Give her wheat hila! Give her grape nuts! Give her away! Oh, they be quiet! Fillimore! Sir Wilfrid comes in. Hello! We'd almost given you up. Just a moment! I'm trying to get Fillimore on the phone to, to tell Mrs. Carslake. No good, my boy. She's on her way here. John drops the book and looks up dumbfounded. The Reverend Matthew was here, you see, and he said... Mrs. Carslake is coming here? Sir Wilfrid nods. To this house? Here? That's right. Coming here? You're sure? Sir Wilfrid nods assent. Fiddler, I want you to stay here, and if Mrs. Carslake comes, don't fail to let me know. Now, for heaven's sake, what did Matthew say to you? Come along in and I'll tell you. On your life now, Fiddler, don't fail to let me... Sir Wilfrid carries John off with him. Vida from the dining room. Ah, here you are. Phew. A moment's pause, and Cynthia opens the front door and comes in very quietly, almost shyly, as if she were uncertain of her welcome. Fiddler, where is he? Has he come? Is he here? Has he gone? Nobody's gone, ma'am, except the Reverend Matthew Fillimore. Matthew? He's been here and gone? Fiddler nods assent. You don't mean I'm too late. He's married them already? Nogum says he's married them. He's married them? Married, married before I could get here. Sinking into an armchair. Married in less time than it takes to pray for rain. Oh well, the church. The church is a regular quick marriage counter. Vida and John are heard in a light-hearted laughter. Oh. I'll tell Mr. Carslake. Cynthia, rising and going to the dining room door, turns the key in the lock and takes it out. No, I wouldn't see him for the world. If I'm too late, I'm too late, and that's the end of it. I've come, and now I'll go. There is a long pause during which Cynthia looks slowly about the room, then sighs and changes her tone. Well, Fiddler, it's all a good deal as it used to be in my day. No, ma'am. Everything changed. Even the horses. Horses? How are the horses? Ah, uh, when husband and wife splits, ma'am, it's the horses that suffer. Oh, yes, ma'am. We're all changed since you give us the go-by. Even the governor. How's he changed? Lost his shot for horses and ladies, ma'am. Gives them both the boiled eye. I can't say I see any change. There's my portrait. I suppose he sits and pulls faces at me. Yes, ma'am. I think I'd better tell him you've been here. No, Fiddler, no. The room's in a terrible state of disorder. However, your new mistress will attend to that. Why, that's not her hat. Yours, ma'am. Mine? Walking to the table to look at it. Is that my work basket? My gloves? Fiddler assents. And I suppose... Hurriedly going to the writing table. My, yes, there it is, my wedding ring. Just where I dropped it. Oh, 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 he keeps it like this. Hat, gloves, basket, and ring, everything just as it was that crazy mad day when I... She glances at Fiddler and breaks off. But for heaven's sake, Fiddler, set that chair on its feet. Against orders, ma'am. Against orders? You kicked it over, ma'am, the day you left us. No wonder he hates me with the chair in that state. He nurses his wrath to keep it warm. So after all, Fiddler, everything is changed, and that chair is the proof of it. I suppose Cynthia Kay is the only thing in the world that cares a whinny whether I'm alive or dead. She breaks down and sobs. How is she, Fiddler? Off her oats, ma'am, this evening. Off her oats? Well, she loves me, so I suppose she will die, or change, or, or something. Oh, she'll die, there's no doubt about that. She'll die. Fiddler, who has been watching his chance, takes the key off the table while she is sobbing, tiptoes up stage, unlocks the door and goes out. 
After he has done so, Cynthia rises and dries her eyes. There. I'm a fool. I must go before... before he... As she speaks her last word, John comes in swiftly. Mrs. Carslake! I... I... I just heard Cynthia Kay was ill. I... I ran round and I... Oh... Well, I understand it's all over. Yes, it's all over. How's the bride? Oh, she's a wonder. Indeed. Did she paw the ground like the war horse in the Bible? I'm sure when Vita sees a wedding ring she smells the battle afar off. As for you, my dear Carslake, I should have thought once bitten, twice shy. But you know best. Vita, unable to keep her finger long out of a pie, saunters in. Oh, Cynthia, I've just been through it again, and I feel as if I were eighteen. There's no use talking about it, my dear. With a woman it's never the second time. And how nice you were, Jack. He never even laughed at us. Sir Wilfrid follows her with hat and cane. Vida kisses John. That's the wages of virtue. Sir Wilfrid in time to see her kiss John. I say, is it the custom? Every time she does that, my boy, you owe me a thousand pounds. Seeing Cynthia, who approaches them, he looks at her and John in turn. Mrs. Carslake? To John. And then you say it's not an extraordinary country. Cynthia is more and more puzzled. See you next Derby, Jack. Walking to the door, to Sir Wilfrid. Come along, Wilfrid. We really ought to be going. To Cynthia. I hope, dear, you haven't married him. Philimore's a tomb. Good-bye, Cynthia. I'm so happy. As she goes. Just think of the silly people, dear, that only have this sensation once in a lifetime. John follows Vida out the door. Good-bye, Mrs. Carslake. And I say, you know, if you have married that dull old Philemore fella, why, when you've divorced him, come over and stay at Trainham. I mean, of course, you know, bring your new husband. There'll be lots of horses to show you, and a whole covey of jolly little case derbies. Mind you come. Never liked a woman as much as in my life as I did you. Wilfred, dear. Except the one that's calling me. John returns, and Sir Wilfred, nodding to him, goes out. John shuts the door and crosses the room. There is a pause. So you're not married? No, but I know that you imagined I was. I suppose you think a woman has no right to divorce a man, and still continue to feel a keen interest in his affairs? Well, I'm not so sure about that, but I don't quite see how— A woman can be divorced, and still— John assents. She hides her embarrassment. Well, my dear Carslake, you've a long life before you, in which to learn how such a state of mind is possible, so I won't stop to explain. Will you be kind enough to get me a cab? She moves to the door. Certainly. I was going to say I'm not surprised at your feeling an interest in me. I'm only astonished that— Having actually married Philimore, you came here— I'm not married to him. I left you on the brink. Made me feel a little uncertain. I changed my mind, that's all. Of course. Are you going to marry him? I don't know. Does he know you— I told him I was coming here. Oh! He'll turn up here, then, eh? And you'll go back with him, I suppose. Oh, yes, I suppose so. I, I haven't thought much about it. Well, I'll sit down, do. Till he comes. Talk it over. He places the armchair more comfortably for her. No, this is a more comfortable chair. You never liked me to sit in that one. Oh, well, it's different now. Cynthia moves and sits down near the upset chair. There is a long pause, during which John thoughtfully paces the room. You don't mind if I smoke? No. Of course, if you find my presence painful, I'll skidoo. He indicates the door. Cynthia shakes her head. John smokes his pipe and remains seated. It's just simply a fact, Carslake, and that's all there is to it. If a woman has once been married, that is, the first man she marries, then she may quarrel, she may hate him, she may despise him, but she'll always be jealous of him with other women. Always. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. Uh. Yes. Yes. You probably felt jealous of Philimore. No. I felt simply... Let him take his medicine. Oh. I beg your pardon. I meant— You meant what you said. Mrs. Carslake, 
I, I apologize. I won't do it again. But it's too late for you to be out alone. Philip will be here in a moment, and of course then... It isn't what you say. It's... it's everything. It's the entire situation. Suppose by any chance I don't marry Philimore. And suppose I were seen at two or three in the morning leaving my former husband's house. It's all wrong. I have no business to be here. I'm going. You're perfectly horrid to me, you know, and the whole place, it's so familiar and so... so associated with... with... Discord and misery. I know. Not at all with discord and misery. With harmony and happiness. With... with first love and infinite hope and... and Jack Carr's like, if you don't set that chair on its legs, I think I'll explode. John crosses the room rapidly and sets the chair on its legs. His tone changes. Ah, there. I beg your pardon. I believe I hear Philip. No. That's the policeman trying the front door. And now, see here, Mrs. Carslake. You're only here for a short minute because you can't help yourself, but I want you to understand that I'm not trying to be disagreeable. I don't want to revive all the old, unhappy... Very well, if you don't. Give me my hat. And my sewing. And my gloves, please. She indicates the several articles which lie on the small table. Thanks. Cynthia throws the lot into the fireplace and returns to the place she has left near the table. There. I feel better. And now all I ask is... <laughs> My stars, what a pleasure it is. What is? Seeing you in a whirlwind. Oh. No, but I mean a real pleasure. Why not? Time's passed since you and I were together and... Uh, and you've forgotten what a vile temper I had. Well, you did kick the stuffing out of the matrimonial buggy. It wasn't a buggy, it was a brake cart. It's all very well to blame me, but when you married me I'd never had a bit in my mouth. Well, I guess I had a pretty hard hand. Do you remember the time you threw both your slippers out the window? Yes, and do you remember the time you took my fan from me by force? After you slapped my face with it. Oh, oh, I hardly touched your face. And do you remember the day you held my wrists? You're going to bite me. Jack, I never. I showed my teeth at you, and I said I would bite you. Cynthia, I never knew you to break your word. And anyhow, they were awfully pretty teeth. And I say, do you remember, Sin? You oughtn't to call me Sin. It's not nice of you. It's sort of cruel. I'm not Sin to you now. Awfully sorry. Didn't mean to be beastly, Sin. Cynthia turns quickly. John stamps his foot. <clears throat> Cynthia! Sorry, I'll make it a commandment. Thou shalt not sin. Cynthia laughs and wipes her eyes. How can you, Jack? How can you? Well, hang it, my dear child. I, I'm sorry, but you know I always got foolish with you. Your laugh would make a horse laugh. Why, don't you remember that morning in the park before breakfast? When you laughed so hard your horse ran away with you? I do, I do. Both laugh. The door opens and Nogum comes in, unnoticed by either. But what was it started me laughing? That morning, wasn't it somebody we met? <laughs> wasn't it a man on a horse? <laughs> of course. You didn't know him in those days. But I did. And you looked a sight in the saddle. Nogum, trying to catch their attention, moves toward the table. Who was it? <laughs> Philibor. He's no laughing matter now. Scene Nogum. Jack, he's here. Eh? Oh, Nogum? Mr. Fillimore, sir. In the house? On the street in a hansom, sir, and he requests Miss Carslake. That'll do, Nogum. Nogum goes out, and there is a pause. John, on his way to the window, looks at Cynthia, who has slowly risen and turned her back to him. Well, Cynthia? Well? It's the hour of decision. Are you going to marry him? Speak up! Jack, I... I... There he is. You can join him. Join Fillimore and go home, with him to his house and Miss Hennage and... The door's open. No, no, it's mean of you to suggest it. You won't marry? Fillimore, no, never. Running to the window. No, never, never, Jack. John opening the window and calling out. It's all right, Judge. You needn't wait. There is a pause. John leaves the window and bursts into laughter. He moves toward the door and closes it. Cynthia looks dazed. Jack! John laughs. 
Yes, but I'm here, Jack. Why not? You'll have to take me round to the Holland house. Of course I will. But I say, Cynthia, there's no hurry. Why, I, I can't stay here. No, of course you can't stay here. But you can have a bite, though. Cynthia shakes her head. John places the small chair, which was upset, next to the table and the armchair close by. Oh, I insist. Just look at yourself. You're as pale as a sheet. And here, here, sit right down. I insist. By George, you must do it. Cynthia moves to the chair drawn up to the table and sits down. I am hungry. Just wait a moment. John rushes out, leaving the door open. I don't want more than a nibble. I am sorry to give you so much trouble. No trouble at all. From the dining room comes the cheerful noise of glasses and silver. A handsome, of course, to take you round to your hotel. I wonder how I ever dreamed I could marry that man. Can't imagine. There. I am hungry. Don't forget the handsome. She eats. He waits on her, setting this and that before her. John goes to the door, opens it, and calls. Nogum, a handsome at once. Yes, sir. How does it go? It goes all right. Thanks. You used to like anchovy. Claret? Cynthia shakes her head. No, oh, but you must. Ever so little. He fills her glass and then his. Thanks. Here's to old times. Please not. Well, here's to your next husband. Don't. No, oh, well then, what shall the toast be? I'll tell you. You can drink to the relation I am to you. <laughs> well, what relation are you? I'm your first wife once removed. <laughs> I say, you're feeling better. Lots. It's a good deal like those mornings after the races, isn't it? Yes. Is that the handsome? Nope. What is that sound? Don't you remember? No. That's the rumbling of the early milk wagons. Oh, Jack. Do you recognize it now? Do I? We used to hear that. Just at the hour, didn't we? When we came back from awfully jolly late suppers and things. Hmm. It must be fearfully late. I must go. She rises and moves to the chair where she has left her cloak. She sees that John will not help her and puts it on herself. Oh, don't go. Why go? All good things come to an end, you know. They don't need to. Oh, you don't mean that. And you know, Jack, if I were caught, seen at this hour, leaving this house, you know, it's the most scandalous thing anyone ever did, my being here at all. Goodbye, Jack. I'd like to say, I... 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 Well, I shan't be bitter about you hereafter, and... Thank you awfully, old man, for the fodder and all that. She turns to go out. Mrs. Carslake, wait. Well? I've rather an ugly bit of news for you. Yes? I don't believe you know that I've been testing the validity of the decree of divorce which you procured. Oh, have you? Yes. You know, I felt pretty warmly about it. Well? Well, I've been successful. The decree's been declared invalid. Uh, understand? Not precisely. I'm awfully sorry. I'm awfully sorry, Cynthia, but you're my wife still. Honor bright? Crazy country, isn't it? Well, Jack, what's to be done? Whatever you say. Nogum quietly coming in. Handsome, sir. He goes out and Cynthia rises. Why don't you finish your supper? The, the handsome. Why go to the Holland? After all, you know, Sin, you're at home here. No, Jack, I'm not. I'm not at home here, unless... unless... Out with it? Unless I... unless I'm at home in your heart, Jack. What do you think? I don't believe you want me to stay. Don't you? No, no, you hate me still. You can never forgive me. I know you can't, for I can never forgive myself. Never, Jack. Never, never. She sobs, and he takes her in his arms. Sin, I love you. And you've got to stay. And hereafter you can chuck chairs around till all's blue. Not a word now. He draws her gently to a chair. Oh, Jack. Jack. I'm as hungry as a shark. We'll nibble together. Well, all I can say is, I feel that of all the improprieties I ever committed, this, this. This takes the claret, eh? Oh, Lord, how happy I am. Now don't say that. You'll make me cry more. 
She wipes her eyes. John takes out the wedding ring from his pocket. He lifts a wine glass, drops the ring into it, and offers her the glass. Cynthia! What is it? Benedictine! Why, you know I never take it. Uh, take this one for my sake. That's not Benedictine. What is it? John slides the ring out of the glass and puts his arm about Cynthia. He slips the ring onto her finger, and as he kisses her hand, says, Your wedding ring! End of Act Four End of the New York Idea by Langdon Mitchell